lunch. Are there, is there further debate? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on um, uh, Program 2, Infrastructure for Brisbane. Uh, can I start with just a few things that are in uh, the budget uh, today and then a little bit on uh, citywide issues? Um, firstly, can I say, Councillor Cooper, during the information um, sessions, uh, was, was a little bit confused, I think is the right word, um, about the Mogul Road, Coonan Street uh, intersection upgrade. Um, she wasn't sure uh, what the federal government had announced and when the funding might come through, and um, you know that was very unclear to her. Um, but let me tell you what is on the public record with respect to, and, and she is the chairperson in charge of the area, so you would think that she has some idea of. Um, asking the federal government for funding for a major project uh, that Brisbane City Council is undertaking, but she really didn't have much idea. Um, so let me be clear about what is on the public record. In April this year, uh, uh, Julian Simmons um, announced that the Mogul Road Coonan Street project was, I quote, shovel ready, uh, that the funding was, and I quote, ready to go and the project was designed to dovetail with the, June, uh, with the council budget in June. Uh, he also announced uh, that, uh, of course, doing the, the roundabout was going to lead to upgrades to the Walter Taylor Bridge. Now, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that all four of those statements are completely untrue. Completely untrue. <laughs> Let me start on the public record with what this council is doing. This year they've allocated a paltry $335,000 to this project. That comes on top of $2 million for planning works undertaken over the last two years. We are still in planning, um, having checked the files and had an eye-opening um, look at what this council is doing. There are currently eight options being considered. Council still doing preliminary work like geotechnical testing of the soil in the area. They do have, though, a plan for development around the intersection upgrade um, that they are considering. So, number one, Councillor Simmons has uh, publicly misled people, uh, both in my ward and in the Walter Taylor ward, about the status of this project. He went out um, with the uh, then federal minister and announced uh, that he had secured $25 million and it was all ready to go. So uh, my understanding is yes, there is $25 million, and as C Councillor Cooper didn't know, uh, Councillor Cooper, $15 million is allocated in next year's financial budget and $10 million the year after in the federal budget. The problem with all of that is there is no council project ready to go. Um, from what I've seen in the files, council is only looking at the Mogul Road, uh, Coonan Street roundabout, and the intersection of Keating Street. There is absolutely nothing in the council files that indicates they are looking uh, south of Keating Street with respect to upgrades to Coonan Street. Um, now, the big lie that Councillor Simmons has told will be exposed when the draft plans are released. Um, and the fact that additional intersections are being put into a congested corridor um, you know, will simply slow down traffic from my ward trying to head into the city. Uh, so. Um, you know, the person again who should be a little bit upset, I think, by all of this is, is the new councillor for Walter Taylor, whose, whose colleague and friend has dug him a giant hole. I mean, it's April that uh, Julian Simmons was out there basically claiming this was ready to go, it was all funded. Council doesn't even have a preferred design option. And there's $300,000 for planning this year. That's it. So, you know, here's another project where um, Councillor Cooper, um, I can't believe she didn't know as the chairperson. I mean, it was pretty easy to check the federal budget and find out what was going on. Um, but two, um, you know, Councillor Simmons has really left her in a, in a terrible hole. Um, it is unacceptable that this council continues to mislead people that somehow the Coonan Street uh, and Walter, uh, Coonan Street Mogul Road project will do something to help the Walter Taylor Bridge congestion. It will not. It will not. And it's certainly not part of the scope of the plans. And if Council continues with this lie, um, I will continue to point it out publicly. 
Um, I wanted to talk about um, resurfacing. This is one of the issues in the budget uh, that honestly is just hard to fathom, and I still haven't heard an explanation from either the Lord Mayor or the uh, Chairman uh, of this portfolio area. Uh, last year, and, and fairly regularly, about $90 million is spent on resurfacing council roads. This year, yes. it is $72 million. Yep. That is an $18 million cut, or a 20 per cent cut, to the road resurfacing <sighs> budget. There's been zero explanation uh, to the chamber, to the public, about why there's been such massive cuts to road resurfacing. Um, last year, for example, there were 20 road resurfacing projects in Tennyson Ward. This year, there are just 12. Um, and many projects, including Woodville Place at Annerley. Point of order, uh, Mr Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Cooper. Uh, road resurfacing is not under my responsibility. Therefore, it is not relevant to be debated as part of the discussion on this program. Thank you. I'm referring to 2.1.3.1, Mr Chairman. Thank you. I'll just have a quick look. It is part of maintain and improve the network on page 34. Continue. continue. I've already asked you to continue. So her point of order would not be upheld? Just checking. E either, either you, if you no longer wish to speak, that's your I that's wish your, to speak, um, prerogative, but I just but find it staggering that the chairperson of the infrastructure committee has stood up and said that 2.1.3.1 is not in her area of responsibility. I mean, that's just astonishing. No wonder resurfacing um, has been cut. Um, Lord Mayor, you're sitting there. Your own chairman doesn't think she's responsible for administering this budget program. No wonder it went from 90 million to 72.8 million. Councillor Cooper thinks it's not hers. Here it is in the budget. She's responsible. Um, and she's clearly not interested, not interested at all, based on those comments. Uh, uh, now, please, please, Councillor Johnson, just if, you could, if I could just ask you to, to maintain your focus on the substantive portions of the, the budget, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. I'm speaking to what's in the budget. The only person who doesn't think this is in her budget is Councillor Cooper. She's clearly not interested. She doesn't want it. She thinks it's somebody else's job, yet 2.1.3.1 <coughs> is clearly a $72 million portfolio responsibility of Councillor Cooper's, and she's not interested. Doesn't believe it's hers. These are some of the things that she doesn't think are hers either. Resurfacing Woodville Place in Annerley, resurfacing Victoria Avenue in Chelma, resurfacing Wiley Street in Gracefull. These are all Councillor Cooper's responsibilities. Um, but now she's on the public record saying, no, nah, not me, not my responsibility. That's not good enough. That is not good enough. And I flag I've got an amendment that I'm going to move to to fix some of these things. Um, there's no money to deal with the low rail bridge at Sherwood and Corinda that I specifically spoke to the Lord Mayor about. Not even a little bit of planning money. Not even a little bit of planning money to get council started on what it might need to do with the road issues. Uh, there's no money for the intersection upgrade of uh, the Graceful Five Ways, which is an LGIP project. There's no traffic lights for Hyde Road uh, near the retirement village. The 150,000 will be probably enough for a refuge, but even the officers couldn't tell me that. Um, Ipswich Road Annerley, the safety improvements out of Move Safe, absolutely nothing uh, to deal with the very dangerous Ipswich Road Annerley uh, through the Ju Annerley Junction Shopping Centre or uh, Lagonda Street Annerley, where Dr Jeff Copeland was killed. Um, there's nothing to deal with those issues um, that were in the top 10 move safe issues of this city. Um, this administration, um, far from the Lord Mayor's rhetoric that we invest in the suburbs, has failed to invest in the necessary projects uh, needed in Tennyson Ward. Um, I, I, just, I, I just see year after year uh, massive problems with the way this administration works. And I'd just like to give one example before I move my amendment. 
major traffic, uh, sorry, LATMs, local area traffic management plans. There's $1.6 million in there. We haven't had one in my area for 10 years. 10 years. Um, but let me give you an idea of how this administration rolls. There are uh, 12 projects. Uh, only two of those are on the south side. So this is a budget for the north side. Um, only one of those projects is in um, an ALP. Councillor Johnston, your time has expired. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I move that the following amendment to Program Two Infrastructure for Brisbane. I'm not sure that's allowed. That Section 142, one, uh, sorry, that 142,000 is transferred from Item 2.1.1.1 Plan and Design the Network Long Term Transport Planning 5.542 million to Item 2.1.2.2 Improve Local Transport Networks Local Access Improvement to fund two new projects. One, build a safety, pedestrian safety refuge at Park Road at the intersection of Verney Road East Graceville, 60,000. And two, build and install a zebra crossing and build outs across the Pell Street Graceville outside Graceville Rail Station, 82,000. Seconded. This would have been simpler had you done it in your speech. We'll have to consider whether it's a relevant motion. That may take some time. In the name of keeping the meeting moving, I'll allow it. Thank you. Do you have a copy of it? I do. Is it being distributed to the council? No, 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 he's asked me to distribute it to the It's been moved by Councillor Johnston, uh, seconded by Councillor Griffiths, that an amendment to the program be considered by this council. Councillor Johnston, to the amendment, please. Yes, thank you. The amendment before us today uh, seeks to take $142,000 uh, that, uh, that is allocated to a program called long-term planning, um, which is essentially unallocated. It's not allocated towards any particular project. Uh, it is only um, allocated uh, for the purposes of long-term planning. Now, in my view, there are very short-term, important public and active transport committee, uh, public and active transport projects that we need to deliver in the city, um, and there are two that have been on my list uh, for some period of time. And the first one that I want to discuss is uh, item two in the amendment, which relates to the crossing and the build-outs across the Pell Street Graceville at Graceville Rail Station. 
Uh, this again was a top 10 identified, resident identified safety project in the Move Safe campaign undertaken by this council last year. Um, the two areas in my ward where people wanted safety changes were on Ipswich Road, Annerley, and on Appel Street at Braceville. They spoke up in their hundreds to say, make our area safer. Now, I was always promised by Pat Chin, as it was in the day, um, as the uh, roads officer, that once the Graceville Rail Station upgrade had been completed, uh, Council would undertake the necessary crossing upgrade to facilitate safe access. That has not occurred. It is a very simple solution here. Um, we need some build-outs and we need a zebra crossing. Uh, it can be easily designed, it's very low cost, and it will make it much safer for uh, the children who go to Graceville State School and Christ the King, and the high school students who hop on the train to go to Indrapilly or Corinda State High, or the, very, or the many private schools uh, where children are going to school, as well as all the commuters, the walkers, and everybody who uses the underpass at Graceful, because it is a major pedestrian thoroughfare in addition to providing access to Graceful Rail Station. Uh, the zebra crossing and build outs are absolutely essential. Uh, they are supported by the Move Safe report, um, and there is absolutely no reason why $82,000 out of a $5.5 million project cannot be reallocated uh, to deliver a safer crossing point at Graceful. Now, um, a few weeks ago when I met with the Lord Mayor, uh, he said he wanted to work with me. Here is his chance. Here is his chance. Uh, Councillor Owen is sitting over there while this meeting is going on, um, presenting herself to the public as the LNP candidate for Morton. She has every opportunity now to vote for a project that would help uh, graceful residents, that graceful residents want. She's delusional. She still thinks she's the LNP candidate for Morton. Um, so let's be clear, is she going to vote against uh, important road safety and pedestrian projects for the people of Graceville? Now, the second one is a Jane Prentice-initiated uh, uh, refuge that's been on the list since before I was the councillor, and that's going on 11, well, almost 12 years next year. Uh, this is a uh, intersection that leads to Graceville State School. Uh, a wonderful active travel school has been uh, you know, for many, many years, uh, $60,000. And I know there are residents uh, of Park Road, Graceville, that want to see uh, safer community facilities uh, in Graceville. And I know, you know, for example, Councillor Mackay likes to come to Graceville State School and participate in community life at Graceville State School. And I'd be thinking that he'd want to support that school community. He'd want to uh, make sure he stood up and said, yes, we will give the nearly 900 children that walk, ride, scoot, um, safer crossing points so they can get to school. I presume the Lord Mayor, who's going to go out in a few months' time and ask people in Graceville to vote for him, will stand up and support these two projects um, because uh, he wants to say to those people, well, I'll support you if you support me. That would be a good way of doing it, wouldn't it? Um, or maybe Councillor Cooper. She hasn't said this one's not her responsibility yet, so maybe she'll stand up and say, yes, I support um, uh, these important safety initiatives at Graceville State School. Let me be clear, um, this doesn't affect anybody's projects. It doesn't affect funding for any ward. It simply takes $142,000 of unallocated funds out of a huge $5.5 million planning uh, budget and allocates it to two small and essential road and pedestrian safety projects in Graceville. Um, I urge all councillors to support the amendment. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I'd rise to speak briefly on this amendment. I think um, there's a lot of merit in it, and I think the, it touches on a broader problem in terms of the way we allocate um, project funding in this city. And I've raised this with council staff in the past, but I, I'm speaking now because I particularly want to draw the mayor's attention to it, which is that um, we spend a huge amount of money and time and energy on, on planning and analysing the network and thinking about where best to allocate money, but then give comparatively little weight to the insights and, and, and wisdom of local councillors. And I think th that's a shame. We obviously get consulted and we can make our recommendations and we can, um, we can advocate for individual projects. But 
on balance, the, the voice of individual local councillors is it's not accorded as much weight as I think it should be. And I think that, that comes through here really clearly where um, a local councillor has clearly identified some high priority projects that have been waiting a long time. Um, and we have so much money allocated towards long-term planning, even though councillors ourselves are also doing our own long-term planning. And we're talking to the community much more regularly and in more detail than many of these council offices. And I, I think it's, it's no disrespect to those offices, but the, there are certain limits to centralised planning that I'm sure all councillors in this chamber would agree with. And when we put all our emphasis on uh, centralised planning, where we look at a, a, an, an aerial map from City Hall rather than actually talking to people on the ground, we miss things and we get our priorities wrong. And so I think there's a very strong case to be made that we need to put more, more money into these very local targeted projects that have the support of local councillors um, and, and I see nothing wrong with supporting this motion. I encourage other councillors to support it as well. Further speakers? Lord Mayor. Uh, just briefly, um, my understanding this is the money that was given to us by the federal government to do work on the north side um, transport corridor and develop a north side transport action plan. It's a federal government grant of uh, $10 million to be spent over two years. It is not, not available for the purposes that Councillor Johnston uh, requires it for. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor Johnston. So, thank you. Um, at least someone spoke on this motion. Uh, let's be clear, uh, Mr Chairman. I thank Councillor Shree for um, identifying what is a significant um, and fundamental flaw in the way these um, projects are identified. Um, when they're identified by local council as a priority, I think that's probably the kiss of, kiss of death in town, um, and they just don't ever happen. Um, but more importantly, um, with the crossing at Graceville, um, that's actually been identified by council, the organisation, um, through its Move Safe report as a top 10 priority area. Um, and yet this council is not funding any money to deliver on the important um, uh, public and active uh, travel uh, initiative that could be um, delivered here. Uh, and I think that is incredibly disappointing because it, it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be about me standing up saying I want this little bit of money for my ward, even though that's what I have to do because it's not being done through the institutional budget process, so to speak. Um, when we get reports like this, like Move Safe, that identify specific areas of concern in our community, it should be like a warning bell going off. Ding, 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 ding. Um, this is where we need to invest. This is where it will help local communities. This is where we will make it safer. And this is where we will improve access to public and active transport. Um, but that doesn't enter into the thinking of uh, this administration. Uh, instead, uh, they are focused on um, largely funding projects in their own wards um, and, two, mainly on the north side. Um, it's disappointing, I think, that the, uh, that the Lord Mayor has stood up and said that this is long-term uh, transport uh, planning funds that have come from the federal government. Um, I mean, I, I'm happy to ask them if they're prepared to give $100,000 over to support Graceville. Um, I would have thought that the candidate for Morton, the LNP candidate for Morton, perhaps would be straight on the phone to them saying, oh, gee, Minister, can we have some money for Graceville? Um, you know, I, I didn't see her doing much of that during the federal election campaign, but given just two hours ago she was on Facebook um, presenting herself in that way, I would have thought that a more useful thing might be um, that she advocates for some funding for projects in her area. Um, so I don't know whether they'd say no. I don't believe that is a reason um, to reject the uh, motion or the amendment before us today. Um, if we move the amendment um, and we write to the feds and say, well, we'll put a little bit towards this, um, I would think that would be an acceptable course of action. Uh, if they come back and say no, well, so be it. But that's not a reason to say no uh, to the funding uh, before us today. Um, because uh, one of the things that we need to do um, it's identified at Infrastructure Australia as one of the most congested corridors in Australia. That's Oxley Road. 
um, and by getting people onto public transport and taking them off Oxley Road, we can achieve the national objectives of reducing congestion through the southwest uh, corridor. We can achieve um, better outcomes locally for residents, and we can take pressure off the Walter Taylor Bridge. So I've got absolutely um, no problem in identifying this as having uh, federal benefits based on the Infrastructure Australia report about the key congested corridors uh, around Brisbane, which include Oxley Road. Uh, and I would just urge all councillors to support the amendment before us today. Um, it will provide uh, much safer pedestrian routes uh, to school, uh, to public transport, and will significantly help graceful residents. And to the amendment, all those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston, Councillor Strunk. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chairman, the noes have it. The voting being two in favour, 19 against and five abstentions. The noes have it. Please return to your chairs. Further speakers, Councillor Huang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to enter the debate on Program 2 of the 2019 20 budget on infrastructure for Brisbane. Mr. Chair, as I was preparing for this budget debate and look back on my previous speeches, I couldn't stop thinking about what would Brisbane be like without its LMP ad administration. There would be no tunnels, no go between bridge, no legacy way, no metro. No player street connection, no McGregor State School drop and go, and most importantly, no future. Thanks to the wisdom of the people of Brisbane for electing Newman, Quirk, and Shrena administrations into City Hall, so Brisbane can keep prospering despite state Labor government continuing to ignore the needs for infrastructure investments in Brisbane. Mr. Chair, in a stark contrast, the 2019 20 Brisbane City Council budget outlines Lord Mayor Adrian Strina's ambition for building an even better Brisbane over the next decade and protecting our incredible lifestyle and green space. Mr Chair, Lord Mayor Adrian Strina and his energetic, energetic team, which consists, consists of energetic, experienced civic cabinet, intergenerational councillors, which have achieved true gender equality based on merits, now on quota, and fresh ideas has presented to the people of Brisbane a council budget with vision for the future. Mr. Chair, infrastructure-wise, 
this administration has consistently delivered for the people of Brisbane by responsibly managing the city's finance and investing the dividends into building infrastructure and growing the Brisbane lifestyle. We all know infrastructure investments for the city will bring significant economic and social benefits. According to the World Bank, infrastructure investments have direct impact on economic and employment opportunities. Uh, <clears throat> and a study by Ernest and Young also shows infrastructure investments will have important social impacts in improving social inclusion, living standards, and help bring down cost of living. Mr. Chair, Brisbane has a as a growing city, is facing the challenges of population growth. It is important for us as a city government to keep investing in our infrastructure to ensure Brisbane residents continue to enjoy the benefits and lifestyle we deserve. Mr. Chair, the vision outlined in this budget is future proving, proving Brisbane's growth and prosperity by tackling traffic congestion and improving Brisbane's transport network to ensure the smooth flow of traffic and get our residents home quicker and safer. Mr. Chair, the $880 million infrastructure investment delivered by Lord Mayor Adrian Strainer in this budget will provide real action in tackling traffic congestions in our suburbs. These projects, ranging from Kingsford Smith Drive in Hamilton to Murphy Road and Ellison Road corridor upgrade in Jibang to major intersection upgrade at Binley Road and Nursery Road in Rancong, and of course, Play Street Connection in Upper Mangrovet. And uh, well, Council Griffiths is not here, unfortunately. If getting $4.4 million for Play Street this year and $1.9 million in Rancong World means we're missing out on something, I'll be happy to miss out in every budget. But, uh, but uh, most importantly, these projects are the ones in making sure our infrastructure can meet the growing demand across our city and get the residents home quicker and safer. Mr. Chair, whilst talking about the infrastructure, I would like to once again raise about Player Street Connection. The Player Street Connection is the best example of about building the infrastructure our growing city needs. Mr. Chair, between 2014 and 2018, there were eight recorded crashes at Castles Road and Cremant Street intersection four of which involved right turn movements to and from Cremon Street, and 19 recorded crashes at Castles Road and McGregor Street intersection, 16 of which required medical treatment and one hospitalization. Castles Road is a state controlled road and forms part of the Brisbane Urban Corridor, a major link in our city's network, carrying approximately 15,000 vehicles a day and up to 3,700 vehicles per hour in peak times. Both federal and state governments identify the road as a key freight route in the regional and national road freight network. In the morning peak period, delays to motorists accessing Castles Road from Player Street will be reduced from four minutes to 40 seconds by 2031. And during the same period, period the McGregor Street approach delay is forecast to reduce from 150 to 40 seconds. This significant reduction in travel time will greatly improve the traffic efficiency around Garden City Shopping Centre, which has been identified as a regional activity centre. Council's business case highlights that this upgrade will improve safety to the extent that up to 75% of the crashes for Castles Road and Cremant Street will be prevented. Council has tried to work with the state government to deliver an upgrade but while the state's network will reap enormous benefits, disappointingly, the state government will not contribute any funding to an upgrade. On behalf of my community and residents on the south side, I would like to thank Lord Mayor Adrian Schrena and Infrastructure Chair Councillor Cooper for progressing this important project. And pleased to acknowledge this investment will deliver the infrastructure that has citywide network impact. I was also pleased to note that as part of the major road network improvement design, there's funding for the completion of Dawson Road, which is uh, between, Magrega, uh, sorry, between Logan Road to Mangrovet Kapalaba Road in Upper Mangrovet. I would also like to acknowledge the safety improvements that were made at two of my schools, St. Catherine's at, at Wishart and uh, Magrega State School, which were delivered through the Enhanced School Safety Program last financial year. I'm disappointed that Council had to ask 
the state government several times to work with us to change the rules to allow St. Catharines to become eligible. As soon as the state changed their criteria, council started work on getting these works delivered. And I was pleased that I could keep the school and the PNF updated on the progress as well as the local state labor member. These safety improvements will help local children travel more safely to and from school. The new school zone was installed in time for the start of term two earlier this year, reducing the speed along the, school, the school's Newnham Road frontage from 60 kilometers per hour to 40 kilometers per hour between 7 to 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. on school days. The delivery of the McGregor's drop and go facility has meant improved pedestrian and motorist safety on McCulloch Street near the Mans Road intersection. The existing drop and go facility at the school was not functioning well due to the limited number of short-term and long-term parking spaces to cope with the school's ongoing expansion, another good example of lack of investment by the state. This new facility created a safer drop and go zone away from the main traffic McCulloch Street as well as, well as put in 15 angled car parks. I was pleased to note that council worked very closely with the school and the PNC to investigate a number of op options to improve access and safety at this location. In this budget, through council's safe school travel infrastructure program, I'm pleased to highlight that council will be delivering safety infrastructure for the Warrego Road State School at, at ML Plains. And in addition, council's strong track record on working with schools to deliver traffic management plans will also see investment uh, for through our traffic management plan improvements program for Robertson State School, for Robertson State School with a splitter island at Dave Road Street uh, at Musgrave Road. Council will also be investing through the local access network improvements program, that is uh, Warrigo Road at Blissby Road at ML Plains. This will build on the infrastructure to improve local con connectivity delivered last financial year at Gasco Street at ML Plains and Warrow Street at Lever Street at McGregor. Mr. Chair, of course, I can keep going on about the important projects that are deliver, delivering real action for our city and our suburbs in tackling traffic-related issues and congestion. But I will leave it to other councillors to share their joy in this chamber. I would just like to conclude by once again thanking Lord Mayor Adrian Strina and the Infrastructure Chair Councillor Cooper for your efforts and dedication in making sure Brisbane tomorrow is even better in Brisbane of today. I commend the program to the chamber. Further speakers, Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, listen, I rise to speak on program two uh, briefly, um, and I just want to start off by um, asking uh, Councillor Cooper if she might, in a reply, uh, let me know what the status is on the um, uh, Progress Road Stage four um, upgrade. There is still about six hundred thousand dollars in the budget. I thought it had been completed, but I, I could be wrong there. Uh, and also the Stapleton Road and Johnson Road upgrade, there's still about uh, 344,000 K uh, in, uh, in that project as well. And I just didn't get a chance to ask those questions yesterday. Um, now moving along, um, we, we did get some money in the ward, uh, which was good for congestion busing, busting, uh, the Anala Avenue and Blunder Road, uh, which is uh, extending a right turn lane there and also one at uh, Progress Road and Archerfield Road as well. Um, I didn't know actually I had a, an issue with, um, with congestion busting there, but obviously our professional officers have identified that as a, pot a potential uh, remedy to the, uh, the buildup of traffic who's wanting to turn right. Um, now, in regards to major traffic improvements, um, I did get a bit of money for a roundabout in Azalea and uh, Eugenia Street. Uh, which was part of a black spot um, program uh, that council is linked in with the federal government. It's good to see that uh, undertaken. We did get one of those this last year as well in Partridge and Parakeet Street, which is uh, working quite well, by the way. I, I thought it was actually going to be a waste of money because I didn't think you could get a bus around that roundabout. Well, the bus actually goes over it, but they're allowed to. I just thought that was a bit strange. I hadn't seen that before. But the, the issue in regards to this uh, major traffic uh, uh, improvements, um, the issue I have for my ward is we have a number of intersections that are continuing to be not, uh, 
not funded for a, uh, an upgrade uh, for lights in these intersections. Now, I talked uh, briefly yesterday in, in my questioning um, to Councillor Cooper in regards to the one that probably stands out the most in my mind, and that's the uh, Azalea, Archerfield and Pine Road. Um, and that, uh, that we've, we've done all the work basically, and it's basically it's spade ready, I think you might as well say, but we're still waiting for that uh, money to come through. And I, I, cost, and I see that, uh, that there's a number of other intersections in this area that I don't think have probably been waiting as long or maybe have a black spot, um, d uh, maybe called black spot. Now I know with the, the, all of these black spots, of course, we're waiting for federal government money as well, but I think in the end, um, I think in the end it's really important that we don't necessarily wait for the federal government money. It would be great if it came through, but we really have to do something in this road, road space because the amount of traffic increase uh, along this Archerfield Road into an industrial area is just ramping up with all the other infrastructure or all the other uh, units of accommodation that's being built right down Pine Road, uh, right up to Archerfield Road. Um, so. We really just need to, uh, and, it's, and it's got a sporting ground right there on the corner as well. So there is so much happening in this intersection. It's quite amazing um, how there's, we've had five really bad accidents that uh, were hot, that people had to be hospitalized over the last five years. And that's again, probably just another word for a black spot. Uh, thankfully we haven't had a death yet. Uh, but I just, I just worry about, uh, every, you know, I just worry. I mean, I was, I was in a, uh, I was in a, uh, an event, and uh, a Vietnamese chap I know came up and says, "Have a look at this on Facebook. We just had another accident in this intersection." And I thought, you know, is anyone, has anyone? Thankfully, the, the gentleman uh, recovered. Um, so, also going through the schedules, um, having looked through the schedules of this program as well. Um, it, there seems to be, uh, and, then, and honestly, there seems to be a bit of pork barreling going on here. And I know uh, Councilman Johnson goes on about this as we do on this side, uh, but it's just this program was really um, solidified in my mind that there is a lot of pork barreling going on. Uh, and, um, and if we just have a look at uh, the uh, preliminary design uh, schedule, uh, there is no non LMP wards listed here as far as uh, suburbs within those LMP wards. Um, and if we have a look at the um, bridge and culvert construction, again, there is no non-LMP wards uh, in, in, this, uh, in this schedule. And then if we have a look at the uh, district projects, there again is no non-LMP wards listed. Thank you, Councillor Cummings for that interjection. Um, so I'll express it a different way if you like. Um, okay, and if we have a look at the local area traffic management, uh, traffic uh, calming, uh, there's 15 LMP uh, wards and two non-LMP wards. We have a look at the uh, retaining wall and uh, embankments. Uh, it's seven to one. <laughs> if we have a look at the construction uh, minor traffic uh, uh, density, uh, it's 10 to one. Um, if we have a look at the uh, urban corridor uh, modernization, seven to one. So I think it's pretty obvious. Um, uh, it was obvious <coughs> to me when I saw that, looking at that, and then that, and, what, and this one actually really jumped out at me. This is the one that actually made me look at all the rest of them, and that was the local area access improvements, where we had, uh, which is 19 to five, and I thought, oh well, you know, 19 five, you know, if you're looking at the you know, the amount of awards that uh, the LMP hold, well, maybe that's uh, justifiable. But then if you have a look at the money, right, um, there, of the five boards that are listed here, and surprisingly, there's one here for Yoronga, actually, which is, uh, must have been a mistake, because uh, Councillor Johnson almost never gets anything, uh, which is the, one of the highest amounts, actually, of $150,000, so that was good for her and her ward. Um, but uh, if you have a look at the breakdown um, of the 3.453 $3 million dollars, uh, the LMP uh, wards are getting $3 million of that. Point of order, Mr. Chair. A point of order to you, Councillor Shrey. Will Councillor Strunk take a question? Councillor Strunk, will you take a question? I'll take a question. Hopefully I can answer it. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, Sorry, Councillor Shrey, please you, Mr. Chair, Councillor Strunk. It's, it's a genuine question. I'm, I'm interested in the conversation about pork barreling. And, yep. um, if, if it is the case that the LNP are prioritising their own wards, why, why is the GABA ward still getting quite a lot of investment? Good question! Good question! Good question! Good question! 
why? I mean, if you if you have a look. Is it the preference deal? All right, everyone. Okay. Okay, councillors, councillors. Councillors, please stop. Please calm. Um, we've all had a moment of, of levity. Councillor Strunk, please continue. Um, Councillor Shri, uh, that's a very good question. Um, we did a breakdown of actually all the wards and how much rate of return. So those people who pay, uh, how much they pay in their rates and how much they actually get back, um, apart from all the normal services that are um, not, uh, you know, identified at a monetary value, um, the GABA ward and the central ward gets the most. The GABA actually gets more back than they pay in last year, last year, right? I don't, we haven't worked it out this year. So I, I, you know, a lot of my colleagues have said to me, are you sure that Councillor Shri is actually not a paid up liberal member of the Liberal Party? Oh. He gets the most back. I wonder. Good grief. I think he's, I think he's card carrying, but he's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty deep in the old wallet. So, anyways, right. anyways, so I hope All that, right. I hope that sort of someone answers your question. Um, but moving on, moving on to this last schedule. Well, well, I have to... <laughs> anyways, we're going to continue to have a look at this, uh, Councillor Shree. I'll tell you, um, because uh, it, it, it defies logic. Anyways, yeah. except uh, maybe you are a member. Anyways. Um, Moving, moving on to congestion busting, um, just to finish off there. Again, Point of order, Mr. Um, Chair. <laughs> Point of order, Councillor Shree. Um, you've previously warned councillors against um, language that's potentially defamatory, and I'd oh, suggest no, that. No, 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 no. <laughs> suggesting I'm a member of the Liberal Party is highly defamatory. <laughs> if he feels defamed, I withdraw. <laughs> Anyway, just to finish off with that, uh, that one, um, it just, that's the one that really jumped out to me to say, just have a look a bit deeper in these schedules and just see where the money's actually going. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further, uh, further speakers, Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on Program 2, which will deliver ongoing investment into infrastructure for my ward of Walter Taylor, a very popular part of our city to live, visit and do business. It is an honour to be the Councillor for Paradise. And I was very pleased to speak on this program of infrastructure today, as well as I was pleased to be provided the opportunity to ask questions at the infrastructure budget information session on Friday. This speech will focus mainly on the fantastic benefits this budget brings to Walter Taylor, but I will also talk more generally about the benefits for Brisbane as a whole. We see in program two that Lord Mayor Adrian Truner's 2019-20 budget will be dedicated to building infrastructure for the Brisbane of tomorrow, excuse me, <clears throat> through an $818 million investment, which will deliver major intersection upgrades, key cycling links and projects to combat congestion in the suburbs. As Councillor Adams said this morning, LNP administrations are known for infrastructure, for making Brisbane more livable. It is achievable to ease congestion, but it's not always about building more roads. It's also about getting cars off roads. And through you, Chair, and for the benefit of Labor, the Lord Mayor said recently, and I quote, this administration has always been focused on building the infrastructure our city and suburbs need with more than $7 billion invested since 2004. That's why I'm allocating more than $818 million in the 2019-20 budget to take real action on traffic congestion so that residents can get home quicker and safer. Let me tell you about one of the more prescient uh, projects included in that fabulous budget allocation. The intersection of Moggle Road and Coonan Street at Indrapilly is congested. As everyone in this chamber knows, the LNP administrations have taken real action on busting congestion at this intersection. The roundabout has been purchased and now funding for the preliminary design of the new intersection is underway. And the federal government has committed substantial investment into this vital piece of congestion busting infrastructure. The Lord Mayor is focused on making sure the Brisbane of tomorrow is even better than the Brisbane of today. He has a vision to get residents home sooner through better public transport, more active travel links, as well as better connected roads. 
Let's talk about some of those better connected roads. The Lord Mayor's 2019-20 budget invests more than $75 million towards tackling congestion, including at significant intersections all over Brisbane. Here are some highlights of the suburban infrastructure highlights in the 1920 budget. $24.6 million for the Wynnum Road corridor upgrade, East Brisbane, Morningside, Norman Park. That's through two Labor wards, is it not? $619,000 to reduce congestion along Inala Avenue at Blunder Road in Inala. That also is in a Labor ward. I could go on, so I will. $2.2 million for the Chatsworth, Boundary and Samuels Roads intersection upgrade in Cooparoo Ward. $1.7 million to improve the... In 1.7 million dollars to 1.7 million dollars to improve the intersection at River Hills Road in Middle Park. And the good people of Paradise, that's Walter Taylor of course, do not miss out. There's 348,000 dollars allocated to improve access to Fleming Road near Kirkdale in Chapel Hill. Of course, there are many, many more intersections funded, but you get the idea, chair. We live in one of the best cities in the world and it's getting better all the time. I also want to mention Council's Local Access Network Improvements Program, as we heard, it's called LANI, which provides infrastructure by delivering pedestrian refuges, traffic islands, crossings, signage and line markings. There are two LANI projects that will be undergoing further community consultation to see if they are supported to move to construction and delivery. The first is at Fig Tree Pocket and the second at Station Road in Indrapilly. I was also excited to see the investment in the Move Safe Brisbane Pedestrian Safety Review, which I understand from the budget information session received more than 6,300 submissions last year. Indrapilly in Walter Taylor was fifth of the top 10 suburbs identified in the Move Safe Brisbane for pedestrian feedback and sixth in cyclist feedback I note the funding by the Lord Mayor, which will allow the investigation of the recommendations, including a review of the speed on Station Row Road from Coonan Street to Moggle Road at Indrapilly. And let me talk just for a minute about how this administration delivers. Specifically, the intersection at Sir Fred Chanel Drive and Gailey Road at Tawong or St Lucia, depending on which side of the road you're standing on. This intersection has experienced a high crash rate in recent years with 19 crashes occurring between 2010 and 2018. But now, what an awesome result. The intersection was a terrible bottleneck, but guess what? That intersection has been upgraded. Final resurfacing is happening tonight, I believe, and I thank the local residents for their patience with the late night works, but it's done to uh, not affect daytime traffic. This new long right turn lane is smoother than a freshly waxed marble. Traffic turning to the UQ will no longer block inbound traffic. This will result in traffic improvements and more importantly, it will reduce crashes. So we've learned what the LNP has delivered and plans to deliver. But what about labor? Rod Harding, the investment banker, has no infrastructure plans. I'm sitting here, I'm listening to labor what are the alternative ideas? You know what I heard? You know what we all heard? Crickets. I haven't heard any ideas of infrastructure from Labor, so I'm going to pull up what I could find. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, claim to be misrepresented. Well, okay. Oh, I thought it was people before politics. I said Labor. Okay. Carry on, uh, Councillor Mackay. I haven't heard any ideas of infrastructure from Labor, so I'll pull up what I could find from Rod Harding's last campaign. Here's a cracker, laying turf on King George Square. There's an event there nearly every week. You know what's going on this week, Chair? Ice skating. Let's go ice skating on the turf. That's a good idea. That's the best idea we've heard about infrastructure from Labor. Or as Councillor Griffiths said today, he wants buses on our green bridges. Watch out the pedestrians on Kurilpa and Goodwill bridges. Labor wants buses on your bridges. The LNP has consistently delivered for the people of Brisbane. We have responsibly managed the city's budget and we're investing the dividends in building infrastructure and growing the Brisbane lifestyle. Councillor Johnson, you had a misrepresentation. 
Um, yes. Please keep it to the topic of the misrepresentation. Yes, yes. I've certainly put forward you, um, uh, um, amendments today outlining a clear uh, course of action for tennis and ward residents, which uh, Councillor Mackay and the LNP <coughs> voted against. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Mackay. Can we just confirm that Councillor Johnson is now a member of the Labor Party chair? Look, I think it's all best if we move forward. But all right, are there further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Chair. Chair, in relation to the. Okay. We're all friends here. We're all going to have a nice meeting. All right. Councillor, count... okay. So, well, Councillor Cumming, please carry on. I think you're being a bit wishful there, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair. But anyway. All right. But anyhow, look. Uh, coming to be heard, uh, yeah, we can speak. be friendly enough towards each other, can't we? Yeah, look. Uh, the uh, program two infrastructure for Brisbane. I just want to go back to one of the issues raised by the Lord Mayor about the, uh, the cruise ship terminal and he was somehow uh, knocking the state government for having uh, given the, uh, the job for the, uh, to, to build the cruise ship terminal to the Port of Brisbane. Well, that's very, very smart politics, you know, a great choice of contractor, you know, that's a terrific organisation, the Port of Brisbane, and they, uh, uh, I'm sure, and they had an interest in, uh, in having some involvement with the cruise ship terminal because it's just across the road from where their, their uh, uh, berths are for the uh, commercial vessels and everything. And uh, I think they'll do a terrific job. And as he said, it's not going to cost the state government a cent. Well, that's, you know, that's well done, state government, well done. And, uh, and, for, and council, uh, you know, repairing a few roads around the place, which is the least they could do, uh, is, you know, it, as I said, it's the least they could do. And, uh, uh, they weren't clever enough to get it for nothing like the state were. So, the, uh, In relation to Kingsford Smith Drive, well, we're still concerned, that, uh, the opposition is still concerned about how much this is going to cost. You know, the uh, uh, 47 million, I think, it was set aside for contingencies has all been gobbled up. Uh, that was a figure that this administration refused to supply at one stage, but then it got released on the ASX, so they, they thought, oh, well, they better, better let us know what it was the, uh, and make, allow, allow it to be made public. Uh, the, uh, and the other thing about the Kingsford Smith Drive project, according to last year's budget, would have been finalised in 2019-20, this financial year, uh, but now there's substantial capital, some uh, 74.877 million uh, budgeted for 2021. So there's still a long way to go with Kingsford Smith Drive. It's cause gonna... The other thing we're concerned about is how much of the additional costs being incurred are going to be paid by the contractor and how much uh, is council going to be expected to pay because that'll be more bad news for ratepayers. Road resurfacing, as someone else pointed out, drops from 90 million last year to 72.2 million. That's a drop of 20% in one year. And then that's despite the poor condition of many streets in Brisbane. And I, I, my personal view is that there's a higher level of development occurring means there's more large and heavy trucks uh, being driven around the streets of Brisbane. And that's uh, meant uh, damage to road surfaces and the standard of road surfaces has generally deteriorated, I believe, in Brisbane over the last couple of years. And this 20% cut in funding for resurfacing won't help that situation at all. The uh, administration in page 27, the value of transport and traffic infrastructure has increased its uh, last year's budget was stated to be $8 billion, and now it's $10 billion. It's gone up 25% in one year, which is sort of pure fantasy. The, uh, Capital for roads and transport network maintenance, uh, 510.889 million was budgeted for 2018-19 financial year, but only 464.053 million uh, delivered. That's 9.2% uh, wasn't delivered, but as we know, this LNP uh, administration are notorious for, they're the, they're the kings of the carryover, and uh, uh, no doubt carryovers have uh, contributed to that uh, uh, big drop in expenditure that uh, wasn't done. Uh, there's also some disturbing uh, figures in this uh, section of the budget about uh, design work having been slashed uh, unmerc unmercifully. And uh, my experience that is, uh, if you don't do the design work, then the projects, future projects are gonna be reduced as well. And uh, uh, so I've got some real concerns about that. Uh, on page 30 in the uh, preliminary road design figure, it's down some 27.7%. Uh, and uh, also on uh, 
the major road networks improvement design capital has collapsed in uh, last year's budget and in future years. So if you total up the, the four years in last year's budget for uh, this item, it was over four million, uh, and then four and a half million, 5.8, 5.9, it was going to be by 21, 22, and it uh, totaled 20.779 million. Uh, this year's budget, the amounts allocated are 1.341 million, 1.395, 1.434, 1.435. So it's only 5.6 million allocated. Uh, only 26.97% of the previous budget allocated. So that's a 73% drop in the design project uh, in over a four year period, which is just a disgrace. And so uh, uh, we're very concerned about that. The uh, other uh, item that's, that's been a collapse in is the congestion busting, busting projects. Uh, it was uh, scheduled to be uh, uh, 5.505 million in the 2018-19 year, and this year it's budgeted for 3.866, which is about 30% drop as well. So all very concerning uh, for the ratepayers, the fact that uh, uh, the roads aren't going to get any better. Uh, there's no uh, design work being done for future projects. And there's uh, individual projects too, which seem to be uh, costing a lot more than they were even in last year's budget and stretching out a lot further. The Gresham Street Bridge, uh, it was uh, in last year's budget, it was going to be complete in 2021. Capital spend 6.204 million uh, in the 2020-21 uh, financial year, uh, and then 5.9 million in the year, be the year before that. Total expenditure 12.13, sorry, 12.131 million. This year's budget, though, it goes from uh, this this financial year 395,000, 2021-12.297 million, 21-22 11.237 million, 22-23 223,000. Finally, finishing in 22-23, total expenditure 24.152 million, double what the uh, what it was in last year's budget. So over 24 million compared to 12 million last year. Well, it sounds like just a typical typical LNP administration project. Uh, the uh, Murphy, Murphy and Allison Road uh, also has uh, uh, seems to be being delayed and taking a lot longer to complete as well. Uh, parking management is one of the areas which is, continues to be a nice little earner for the council. Uh, the profit this year from parking management, 20.649 million and it increases steadily each year for the next four years to 23.336 million in 22-23, which is an increase of 13% over four years. So uh, with all these uh, delays and cost overruns and everything, at least they'll have the parking revenue coming in to, to pay out all the, uh, the bills. To sum up, uh, this uh, section of the budget uh, shows a substantial cut in road resurfacing, a big cut in preliminary design, and a big cut in network uh, design as well, and uh, it shows delays, cost blowouts, and lack of future planning that we have come to expect from this administration. Further speakers? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on Program 2, and can I start by saying that this side of the chamber, Team Schrinner, has a plan in making the Brisbane of the future even better than the Brisbane of today. I'm proud to stand up and say this program is all about getting Brisbane moving or keeping Brisbane moving. The Murphy and Ellison Road project, I'm so glad that Councillor Cumming is interesting in, interested in this project, but it is on track to be delivered on time. This is a vital corridor on the north that not only helps the Marchant Ward residents, but also the Bracken Ridge residents um, and the Deegan Ward residents. This will enable Murphy Road to be four lanes and also putting the extra lights in through the consultation that was brought up, and again I thank Councillor Cooper for it, for the lights at Butt Street. This intersection upgrade is going to provide um, a safer way for people to get home quicker and safer, not only in a vehicle but also walking or by cycle movements um, on the north side. Um, the Raymont Road and Grange Road intersection upgrade, which is due to be completed um, at the beginning of the next financial year, and I know Councillor Wines, you were right there with me through the consultation process of this project. 
This again is about keeping the traffic flowing, um, not having the bank ups and trying to encourage people to stay on the main roads instead of rat running through our local communities. I'm looking forward to this vital project being delivered for the north side. Um, we're also one thing that um, I'm really, really happy about, and Councillor Cooper and the Lord Mayor Adrian Schriner um, have, have we've been working together on this one, is the $1.5 million um, investment um, into the Hamilton and Stabe Road intersection. This piece of infrastructure is vital not only for the residents, my residents in Marchant Ward, but also the over 3,000 staff um, at the Prince Charles Hospital. Let us remember that the state government exempted themselves from in infrastructure when they put their, um, when they put their DA in um, many years ago. But I also want to remind the chamber, or for those who don't know, in 2016, the state government, before they exempted themselves from the planning um, infrastructure, um, they actually identified this intersection as a vital upgrade that needed to be done and delivered before 2018. Now, unfortunately, I wrote to Minister Miles back in 2000, January 2018 about this and many other issues at the Prince Charles Hospital. One of them, parking. They announced they're going to put a parking station in over 12 months ago, but they still haven't done any design on that project. Unfortunately, my staff did have to follow up Minister Miles several times to get a response from my email and meeting request. Um, it took the good Minister for Health 11 months to respond to my correspondence. We received, from a letter we, we sent in January, we received a response from that letter on the 11th of December last year. It is a little disappointing. We've got the wonderful Community Alliance um, on the north side that are working together um, to get this vital infrastructure done. Um, it's, it's disappointing to hear that the local state member has said he's not going to finance or help anybody on this project because it's a council road. Yes, it is a council road, but it's state government infrastructure that is causing a lot of traffic into that area. Again, over 3,000 workers at the Prince Charles Hospital alone. I think it's worth mentioning as well, while we're standing here talking about this, um, this intersection upgrade, it's worthwhile mentioning that we asked, or Councillor Cooper and her staff, asked for a master plan of the Prince Charles Hospital and what the state have envisioned for the Prince Charles Hospital. I'm not sure what the state government are scared of, um, but they are refusing to give us a copy of the master plan and how they want to expand the hospital for future use, years. Again, it is disappointing that the state member is not standing and helping Councillor Cooper and her team um, with getting those plans for her. We're doing the Move Safe program around the hospital to try and fix some of these issues, but without knowing what the hospital is going to be doing with that site, how do we plan for the future? It's like baking, it's like baking a cake with no, no flour or eggs. You can't do it. So we need that plan. Councillors will be heard. <coughs> Councillors will be heard in silence, please. Councillor Hammond. Thank you. So I'm unsure why the state government won't release this information so we can properly plan for the growth with the state government um, around the hospital area. It is very disappointing that the state government continue to bury their head and ignore the situation that they're creating on the north side. Um, Another project, um, Councillor Wines, that you'll be very interested in, because um, it borders myself and Councillor McLaughlin, um, is the congestion busting project that's happening on Lutwich Road and Magar Street. Um, as the three of us would know, this is a project that benefits three wards on the north side, and we're, I look forward to working with both of you and having the plans put forward to how we can reduce the congestion around this particular intersection. 
Um, there is also in the budget, and again, I'm very grateful for this because it's it's quite a um, geological site um, on the north with quite uh, major significance. Um, we're doing some work on the retaining walls on Webster Road and Kedron, um, and on that corner, those of us on the north side will know there's a big, and hopefully it's this one. Um, there's a, the rock there comes from a volcanic eruption um, that happened obviously thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, it's so important that the University of Queensland students actually come out um, and have a look and do some studies on that rock. So thank you, Councillor Cooper, um, for the money in the budget for that. There's um, also on the Grange and Days Road, Councillor Wines, um, again, benefiting two wards, not just one. Um, we're getting some CCTV camera um, at that intersection to again work towards getting people home quicker and safer. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to uh, speak on Program 2, Infrastructure for Brisbane. Uh, and um, I'll start with uh, road resurfacing and curbing and channelling, uh, as that is uh, very much so in this program area. Uh, and to say, to echo the comments of uh, previous speakers on this side of the chamber, that I'm disappointed in the investment in road resurfacing, particularly my community, uh, is an understatement. Uh, last year, we saw over 30 streets and roads resurfaced, um, you know, which was um, chipped away at the list, chipped away at the long list of over 100 that sit on the asset services schedules there uh, seeking funding. Um, but this year we're seeing just 16 um, streets and roads resurfaced, less than half of what was done last year. And what is even worse than that is that the suburbs of Tagum and Shorncliffe will see zero streets and roads resurfaced this coming year. That is zero. These suburbs pay good rates, in Shorncliffe's case, some very high rates uh, up there. There's some um, significantly um, high value properties in that, uh, in that suburb. Uh, and there are plenty of streets, not just in Shorncliffe, but in Tagum as well, uh, and plenty around the other suburbs that aren't getting very many, uh, that are in desperate need of resurfacing. So those residents are seeing, uh, when it comes to very, very basic services uh, from this council, zero return on their rates paid when it comes to basic services like road resurfacing uh, and um, uh, for all but one of my suburbs uh, footpath reconstruction. So using the, the LNP's own language, or they've changed it, they say getting home quicker and safer, now it's sooner and safer, sooner so the safer. focus groups must have changed their responses a little. They like the word sooner rather than quicker. Uh, and they talk about that when it comes to road resurfacing, Mr Chair. So for, for the residents that are living in uh, Tagum and Shorncliffe, this uh, LNP administration have consigned them to getting home slower and more dangerously using their own, uh, their own terms there, Mr Chair. Now, the, I mentioned the asset services list of uh, road resurfacing. I know that now sits at over uh, 100 um, streets that are in desperate need of repair and reconstruction. Uh, so this is a really, really poor outcome uh, for my community. And the, the news for curbing and channelling is even worse. It used to be a case that in one financial year, a lot of that curbing and channelling work would happen, and in the following year, uh, a lot of the road resurfacing work would happen. So, in a lot of those roads and streets that got curbing and channelling work over the last two years, though, something, something stopped working uh, within council on this, uh, and so we'll have streets that have had their curbing and channelling done and not going to get a, a resurfaced job in their street. Where this year there's only one job uh, for curbing and channelling in my ward, and that's in Sylvan Road, uh, which represents around of the budget allocated about 2.2 per cent of that budget, which is um, the pathetically small amount allocated to curbing and channelling. If it was split up equally, uh, that is about half of uh, one share of what a ward should get, Mr. Chair. So, a very, very disappointing result. Um, and I don't believe for one second that this is done completely on a needs basis. There are plenty of other projects around the city, not just in my ward, uh, that uh, uh, 
um, of a much greater need than some of these projects that are being funded. So it's clear that basic works in council, what people expect council to do day in, day out, um, is not being done, and people expect that from their council, and so they should. Uh, when it comes to road designs, there have been uh, well, there'll be two projects there that um, will certainly have an impact on Deegan Ward and Deegan Ward residents. That is the Beams Road um, project and Robinson and Murphy Roads, which is the uh, southern boundary of my ward. There, uh, these are two projects, of course, that are desperately uh, needed with the pace of development and population growth far outstripping the capacity of the council-controlled local road network. I know the administration likes to only talk about the state-controlled road network. We have an extensive council-controlled road network in between those large state roads uh, in my part uh, of the north side, uh, and there is plenty of work that needs to be done on those. Uh, when it comes to district projects, uh, the Deegan Ward has um, fared a bit better, um, probably because the Hanford Road corridor has been desperately underfunded uh, over many years, and it's finally become a priority because it's uh, uh, getting to be um, at that stage there. Once the uh, Murphy Road four-laning project that uh, Councillor Hammond mentioned is complete, the section of Hanford Road outside the Zulmia shops inbound uh, will be the last single-lane section of the entire corridor, uh, which is an incredible pinch point uh, for the morning uh, peak commute. So funding is uh, very welcome and should focus on that section, uh, definitely. Uh, the zebra crossing uh, for Flinders Parade, something that I've spoken at length in this chamber about uh, and out in the community. It's indeed a great win for my community. I congratulate them. We ran petitions over the last, just over the last year, uh, ran petitions uh, um, seeking. I ran some and other locals uh, ran petitions as well. Um, and I know that that the, this crossing that is being funded, plus another one, um, have been sitting on that list um, of projects awaiting funding for many, many years. From this parade is a very busy uh, place at any time, particularly weekends, though. Uh, you can find park run, birthday parties, water sports, special events, swimmers, walkers, cyclists, uh, and of course, uh, um, swimmers, walkers, and cyclists uh, any time, not just weekends, uh, because the zebra crossing is going in will be uh, near the Sangate Aquatic Centre, which is uh, nearing completion. Uh, when you add into that mixed vehicles, both driving along Flinders Parade and reversing out of car parks, it is a recipe for conflict between pedestrians, cyclists and vehicles. The crossing near 8th Avenue, along with uh, the reduction in speed, 240 kilometres an hour, will make this area much, much safer for all users. So, again, a great uh, outcome for the community, uh, and I look forward to seeing the next zebra crossing a little bit further down. Councillor Cooper funded uh, very soon. Please, thank you. There are, of course, uh, um, needs for better connections from that foreshore uh, right back up into the main street of Sandgate, and this is certainly a good start. Uh, when it comes to uh, LATMs, uh, I really didn't think we would see funding uh, for traffic calming in Boondle. It's been something that the community has been battling for more years than I have been a councillor. Uh, we've had our fair share of disappointment from council on this issue. Uh, when I became a councillor, I jumped uh, in and got behind them right from the start. Uh, we petitioned, we surveyed the entire area, which showed a very high support for traffic calming measures. We had public meetings. Uh, those local residents got themselves on the front page of the local paper calling for this, and the desire was clearly there from a majority, a clear majority of people in that community. Uh, but along with that desire um, was uh, an identified need from council there. Um, I remember uh, Councillor Wyndham, the former Councillor Wyndham, saying last year that uh, uh, those people didn't really need traffic coming, they just wanted it. Um, well, I'm glad to see now that he's gone uh, that uh, Councillor Cooper has also uh, heeded uh, uh, that advice from council officers and has seen that there is definitely a need as well as a want for traffic calming in those streets in uh, Boondle. So the funding for consultation and design is a great win for the community uh, and has already been received very well, Mr Chair. It's very important to get this right, so I look forward to working with Council and the community and getting the extent uh, uh, and the design um, right. The second one funded in Brighton is also very important and a great start to address non-local traffic through this corridor parallel to Beaconsfield Terrace, the old North Coast Highway. Uh, finally, on traffic management plan improvements, um, I've spent considerable time working with the Sangate State School community and the broader community and councils, active school travel officers and 
uh, transport planning strategy officers uh, to come up with solutions uh, that will get children and families uh, across Southerton Street and Sandgate uh, more safe than they are able to now. Enrolment data and pedestrian movements showed us that a significant number of families were moving from those streets north of Southerton Street down to Sangat State School, and they had to encounter a significant number um, of streets to, before they even got to cross that road. Uh, so providing safer crossings on this street date back some time with a petition starting back in 2015 for this. Uh, so it's good news for a fantastic active school travel school, uh, and I congratulate Sandgate State School on pursuing this. Uh, and I want to make mention as well of the work to occur at Brackenridge High School under the same program. Um, work follows what could have been a tragic incident um, recently. I know the family of a young girl that was struck uh, at, uh, outside that school there. Many Brighton families uh, who attend Brackenridge High uh, tell me that the drop-off is quite dangerous given that they are dropping, when they come from Brighton, dropping on the other side of the road from the school there. Um, so a uh, safety upgrade there is both very important uh, and timely. I congratulate that school on advocating for that as well. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Owen. I rise today to speak in support of Program 2. and. It's very interesting listening to some of the debate in this chamber today because it really seems that what we're having here is a debate which is being um, socially constructed around a victim mentality per pervade through the politics of envy from those on the opposite side. We really need to actually look at what is going on with this program. And it is important to note that this is about developing infrastructure for the whole of the city. There are no walls between the different 26 wards in this city. Residents travel from ward to ward to ward to ward to get from the south side to the north side. And they use those roads, they use the corridors, they use the infrastructure. Any infrastructure that is invested in within the city of Brisbane is for all the residents of Brisbane, as well as all the visitors to Brisbane. So to continue to harp on and say, my ward didn't get that, my ward didn't get this, that is not constructive in this place. We are here to represent the best interests of all of the residents across the city of Brisbane. Certainly, we would all like projects in our own ward to all be funded, but that is not possible. We have situations where projects, particularly in this portfolio, take a number of years to go from design to the first stage of construction and then to completion. So what we see over a number of years is significant funding in the early and middle years and then a reduction of funding in the third year or the fourth year of the project, whichever it may take to, to deliver that project, depending on its complexity. So there is a spread of funding across the project term. And that is something that those on the other side don't seem to get. So when we have a reduction in funding from one year to the next on a particular project, it is not a cut. It is just the process of the project coming to completion. Councillors will be heard in silence, please. Councillor Owen. Thank you. This is about looking at what the entire city gets so that we can ensure that all residents have the opportunity to visit friends, families, workplaces in any area of the city in as best and most efficient manner as possible. We are focused on this side of the chamber on building the infrastructure that our city and our suburbs need which is why there's been seven, over $7 billion invested since 2004. Now, it's interesting that the Councillor for Forest Lake raised 
the $619,000 to reduce congestion along Inala Avenue at Blunder Road, because that is a project that not only benefits his ward, but it also benefits residents living in my ward, living in the Maruka ward, living in the Jamboree ward, who would all be travelling through that area on a regular basis because it is a major east-west corridor. That is the major east-west corridor for many residents who choose not to use the Logan Motorway toll road. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Strunk. I believe uh, Councillor uh, Owens uh, um, is... Um, Could you, could you turn your microphone off for me? And it's been noted. Councillor Owen, please continue. Thank you. So on the south side, it is very important that we do recognise that many of our residents, and I will speak for the south side because I am a south side councillor and I um, won't um, make comment on the north side because my travel is predominantly on the south side of Brisbane, but I do know that funded within this budget is the $2.2 million for the Chatsworth Boundary and Samuel Roads intersection at Cooper Roo. And I regularly go to many multicultural functions that are held very close to that intersection and do travel through there. There are also, there's also $4.4 million for the Player Street connection at Upper Mount Gravatt, which my colleague, Councillor Huang and I know is a major major intersection. And as I have already referred to, the Inala Avenue at Blunder Road intersection, reducing congestion there, particularly in the mornings, is going to be beneficial to so many residents that are travelling through that corridor. And then we also have the $1.9 million major intersection upgrade at Beanley Road and Nursery Road in the Runcorn Ward. And there's often many times that I have to go through Bean Lee Road. And I know between Councillor Marks and Councillor Huang, we're often going through there um, to attend many different community functions. So even though those projects are not directly in my ward funded in this budget, I know that my residents will benefit from them because it will reduce congestion across the south side, and it will make their journeys to visit friends, family, or go to a workplace, or even access different shopping venues or recreational venues that bit easier, because we are investing in that infrastructure across our city. In respect of the infrastructure, I would like to put it on, to, on the record that my residents are extremely grateful for the Johnson Road, Stapleton Road intersection upgrade. And this has certainly allowed many residents to get home in a safer and quicker manner. And they certainly do appreciate the longer term investment that was put into that project, even though they were very patient when it was delayed so that funding in earlier budgets could be reallocated to other wards across the city that needed roads reconstructed earlier because of the 2011 floods. So from my residents' perspective, we recognise the importance of taking a citywide focus in regards to infrastructure. And I, I don't begrudge the councillors or the residents on the south side of the funding that's come through from the federal government for prioritising a transport action plan for the northwestern suburbs. Anything that we can do across the city that makes congestion reduce is a good thing. And that is where we need to look at these opportunities when they arise and ensure that they are optimised for our residents. The other area of this program I would like to reference is the traffic management plans around schools. And certainly the ongoing investment by this administration in the traffic management plan program is to be commended. And it certainly has been delivering improved safety for students, teachers, other staff, and also residents. 
Now, I know from the traffic data, in particular on Johnson Road, Stapleton Road intersection, how extensive the assessment was there. And I know how the council officers have been working extremely hard, particularly in these areas of traffic management plans, traffic flows, and making sure we are addressing these congestion hotspots across the city. Now, in respect of another aspect of this program, I would like to just acknowledge the work that is being done to be smart and green and how we're undertaking energy efficiencies in lighting our assets, particularly those parks and bikeways that do span um, across my ward. Now, this LED lighting, and this really hasn't been touched during this debate as yet today, it does help reduce Council's energy consumption and deliver on our smart and clean and green city. And what it is actually doing is reducing our carbon footprint by approximately 13 per cent. So we have seen the investment in our Calumvale Ward through upgraded lighting in Algesta Road Park, Springfield Crescent Park in Parkinson, Cole Bennett Park at Algesta, and also Regency Place Park in Stretton. So there is an investment continuing um, in this particular program with 4,000 existing parks and bikeway lights being transferred over to LED. So that is a significant investment in reducing our carbon footprint. Councillor Owen, excuse me, Councillor Owen, your time has expired. Is there uh, further speakers? Councillor Shree. Yeah, please, Councillor Shree, please go ahead. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on program two. I might start by speaking a little bit about the Victoria Street intersection. This is a um, project I've been advocating for for quite a few years now. Um, we've hold, held multiple protests, had a lot of petitions and, and letters to the mayor, and, and finally it seems that all that advocacy has paid off, and I'm, I'm genuinely very grateful to the administration for that. I acknowledge that there are a lot of priorities across the city and um, that this is a particularly expensive project. but. I must say I, I, I am genuinely shocked at how much it's costing just to put traffic lights at this one intersection. I think the total budget mentioned in the estimate sessions was $11 million. And I, I find that really concerning because I think that shows that, that there's a dozen intersections in my ward that have similar problems to that particular intersection. They're, they're not quite as urgent in terms of the pedestrian safety issues, but there, I can think of literally, literally a dozen other intersections that need a similar upgrade in terms of getting lights installed and pedestrian safety improvements. And I would describe all those needs as fairly urgent. So when a single set of traffic lights is costing us more than $10 million, I, I do really wonder and worry about our broader strategy for how we plan for growth and, and traffic going forward. I'll, I'll come to that in a bit more detail, but just specifically around the Victoria Street intersection, I, I'd say through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Adams and to Councillor Cooper and also to the Mayor, wherever he is, um, that I think it's important that we work across programs and across disciplines and portfolio areas to ensure that this intersection upgrade focuses on public transport and active transport as the priorities. I know it's been funded out of program two. But this intersection upgrade should not be about increasing the flow of cars through that, pro through that choke point. It should be about maximising pedestrian safety and reducing pedestrian wait times at that crossing. And it should be about ensuring that buses can flow freely through that intersection and that cyclists can flow safely through that intersection. My concern is that the $11 million price tag arises largely from the fact that Council is proposing to widen the intersection, to significantly increase the size of it so that more cars can move through. That is not a good use of money in that area. We know that that corridor is extremely constrained and that it doesn't make sense to continue to prioritise motor vehicles along Montague Road. So I hope that Councillor Adams and Councillor Cooper will work closely together to ensure that this is treated as an active transport and a public transport project rather than a so-called congestion busting project. That's really, really important to me. I, I really don't want a situation where we end up with what we've had at some of the other intersections in my ward, where after they're upgraded, 
pedestrians find they have to wait even longer to cross the road because the signal timings are geared towards cars or where we spend so much money and, and cause so much disruption and, and headaches to people um, without meaningfully improving those travel times for buses and, and for other active transport users. So I, I would respectfully suggest that we look really closely at how bus jump lanes or bus, bus priority lanes can be incorporated through that intersection um, and that the council officers work with me really closely. I'm keen to be constructive and collaborative, but this is not a, a this is not a, a project about maximising car flow. It's about, it's, it should be about pedestrian safety. I also want to thank the administration for their um, support for exploring speed limits on Vulture Street. I would suggest that we don't need a really long and detailed study. I, I think it would be better to just run a quick poll and say to people in West End, do you support Vulture Street drop into 40 kilometres? And I think you'll get a resounding yes. And then we can move on and start implementing rather than a really long drawn out um, study when I think the community is already strongly behind that and large chunks of Vulture Street are already running at 40 kilometres an hour during peak periods because they've been designated as school zones. When I look at this program budget overall, I think what strikes me is that it's not, it's not just about how much money you spend, but it's, it's about how you spend it and, and what projects you're prioritising. And unfortunately, although there's a lot of money being spent in the Gabble Ward, I disagree with quite a bit of it. And I'm particularly angry about how much money we continue to waste on the widening of Lytton Road. I think that is a shambolic and reprehensible project and an appalling misuse of ratepayer funds. And I'm, I'm really disappointed when I think about all the other things we could have spent those millions and millions of dollars on that we keep frittering away money on stupid road widening projects that will not meaningfully address congestion long term. Now, I've heard Councillor Murphy and previously Councillor Cooper in this chamber talk about how actually the widening of Lytton Road was a, a safety upgrade project as well. That was a sort of secondary justification that was tacked on after a few years of me complaining about the project. But there were many ways to improve safety along that corridor without adding an additional lane in each direction. I, I acknowledge that there have been issues there in the past, but simply widening the whole corridor is a very expensive and inefficient way to improve safety. And I, I'm, I'm really disgusted that we, we spent so much money on that, that project. And I think that project is, exemplifies what, what's going wrong with this administration more generally across the city. And, and through you, Mr. Chair, to all councillors in this place, I, I just want to say to you, what if you're wrong? What, what if the current strategy you're taking towards managing congestion is simply the wrong thing to be doing? What if all the transport planners, all the researchers, all the academics in universities around the world are right and actually widening roads, widening the intersections, continually expanding the road network to carry more cars is a bad idea? Because that's what I think, that, that's what I think is, um, we're getting wrong right now. I think we need to be a few councillors have touched on it. Councillor Murphy has identified that we can't build our way out of congestion, and yet we continue to spend more and more money on, on these um, projects that increase car capacity through the network. And when we're making it more difficult for, difficult for ourselves, not just in the short term in terms of having to pay for that infrastructure, because our maintenance budget is going to continue to rise. And I noted with interest the debates around how um, even when we're spending 70 million plus a year on road resurfacing, that that's not, still not enough to keep up with what's needed. Um, I would suggest that um, we, if we want to reduce the wear and tear on roads and, and thus reduce the financial burden of road resurfacing, we should probably be slowing down the traffic and stopping high volumes of heavy vehicles shortcutting through residential streets. And we also need to be spending money proactively on curbing and storm water drainage so that the roads don't deteriorate as quickly as to begin with, but even if we're doing all that, we, we still don't have enough revenue coming into the city's coffers to continue, to continue expanding the road, work, road network and to maintain it to a high standard. We simply do not have enough money to, to keep pursuing that strategy. But even if we did, it would still be the wrong thing to do because it is encouraging a mode of transport which has disastrous negative environmental impacts and, and is rapidly exacerbating um, fossil fuel emissions and thus climate change. And, and I think we need to really reflect as a city that if we are cont to continue to say to the vast majority of residents, we're gonna keep, keep supporting you to drive and we're gonna keep investing in infrastructure so that more and more people can drive more and more rather than shifting and supporting active transport and public transport, that we are 
we are complicit in and accelerating climate change. And that's something that I think we need to be talking a lot more about in this place. In general, I think we're spending too much money on major road projects and not enough on those much needed local projects. I'm talking about the, the pedestrian crossings, the refuges, the local area traffic management. Instead of spending hundreds of millions of dollars on widening roads, I'd like to see us just spend just a few million dollars on narrowing roads, on widening footpaths, on slowing down traffic and making our neighbourhoods safer and more comfortable for pedestrians so that parents feel comfortable letting their kids walk to school again rather than clogging the roads and having to play taxi driver. That's the change we need to make, is a shift towards active and public transport. And that doesn't mean just spending a little more here on a bikeway or a little more there on a footpath. It means radically rethinking the way we plan and design our transport network so that cars are deprioritised. Now, I'm not anti-car. I know there are some people who have to drive. I know there are some industries that depend on a, a functioning road network. But those people are going to be stuck in congestion long term unless we make a major shift. Just finally, I want to say that the cruise ship industry is ex extremely unsustainable and, and environmentally destructive. And I think we should not be putting any money towards supporting the expansion of the cruise ship terminals or supporting that industry in general. It's environmentally disastrous. Do some research if you're not aware of these concerns. The fossil fuel emissions, the ocean pollutants, that it is not a good industry to be supporting and encouraging. We should be finding other ways to support tourism and, and to support positive recreation and leisure activities. Um, just really quickly, I, I want to thank Councillor Cooper because I've noticed a slight shift in how responsive her offices have been over the last 12 months. Maybe that's accidental, but it's been appreciated. And I hope that collaborative and constructive relationship continues. Councillor but I really Shree, your time has expired. Further speakers, Councillor Richards. Uh, Point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order. I had a, um, oh, a misrepresentation. Me, Councillor Strunk, you a misrepresentation from earlier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, yeah. I think um, Councillor Owen indicated that I was, uh, I was, it was, I had a, ne I had a negative feeling towards the um, that uh, project uh, on Anala and Blunder Road. Uh, I actually praised council officers for identifying the issue uh, because I didn't know I actually had an issue there. Thank you. Apologies, Councillor Richards, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Marks, that this council adjourned for the purpose of afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. See you in 15 minutes.
Further speakers? Councillor Murphy. Sorry, Councillor Davis. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on uh, Program 2, Infrastructure for Brisbane. Can I say, uh, this has always been a very proud uh, program for this administration, this administration which has delivered uh, more infrastructure for the city of Brisbane than any council in history. Um, an administration that is utterly focused on infrastructure which helps Brisbane residents to move around the city so that they can uh, stop spending time sitting around in traffic and spend more time uh, doing what they need to do at work and doing what they love at home with their friends and family. Um, I, I could talk about a lot in this program, uh, but I would like to talk firstly about uh, what those opposite uh, did not talk about. Um, the Leader of the Opposition did not touch at all on the issue of level crossings. Um, and, and this is an issue which uh, I think needs to be talked about. Now, we know that the state government is almost broke. We know that uh, state net debt will soar to $90 billion by 2022 under the financial administration of the state treasurer, Jackie Trad, and the Palaszczuk Labor government. And we know that that debt comes with a heavy price. That millstone which hangs around the state government's neck means that they can't invest in infrastructure. And it was uh, so bizarre to me to see them so proudly proclaiming that 60 per cent of infrastructure spending uh, in this budget will go out into the regions uh, now. Of course, uh, being the LNP, we support the regions, but we also support Brisbane getting its fair share. And when I looked at the spending in this, the eastern suburbs, particularly in the eastern suburbs of Brisbane, um, but more widely around the Brisbane City Council area, I saw an absolute dearth of spending on infrastructure there, particularly when it comes to level crossings. And I thought that perhaps we might have a win. At least one level crossing might get funded in this state budget. Maybe we would finally see the uh, much talked about and, and very little, uh, very little funded Lindum Crossing funded in this budget because we have finally had uh, a major funding commitment from the federal government, $85 million, and then the $40, $40 million funding commitment uh, confirmed in council, which is sitting in the budget papers under the Future Level Crossings uh, project starting in uh, 2021. But there was nothing in the state budget. Not only did it not count as a revenue item from council or from the federal government, it just didn't feature at all. It's almost like the state government has given up completely on level crossings. And so I really don't know what to do now. And the Lord Mayor's copped a bit of criticism this afternoon from, for uh, his perceived poor relationship with uh, Minister Bailey, but this is our experience of Minister Bailey, is that even when we come up with the funding, even when we put the projects in our budget papers and we confirm and sign on the dotted line to get things happening, to make our contributions, the things that he calls on us to do, it's like, it's like talking to that marble pillar there. You just can just get nothing out of it. And so this is where we are now with the Lindham Level Crossing. We hear nothing from the state government. We see nothing from the local member out there, Joan Pease. Uh, we get nothing back from Mark Bailey, and it just sits there. We have $120 million to replace this level crossing, now just sitting in the budget papers of the federal government and the state government, and the residents out that way will get nothing as a result. So uh, I think that's really sad. I think that is really, really sad and disappointing for uh, residents who want to see these level crossings replaced. Um, and you need look, for, look, you need look no further than uh, Melbourne to see an administration down there in the Andrews government, which is actually doing the work, replacing level crossings. You know, they have a plan to replace uh, 50 of them because they have a budget which is in, is in a good enough position for them to be able to do that. So I think it says a lot about the financial management of the state government, a lot about their priorities uh, in that Brisbane is now uh, being completely left behind. They've done an absolute U-turn uh, on a darn. I mean, you could argue that the only achievement that this state government uh, has uh, achieved in the last 
uh, term has been to approve the Adani Carmichael mine, and now because of that they're rushing to uh, flood infrastructure into the regions where they're under pressure, and so Brisbane will continue uh, to lose out. Um, which brings me now to, I suppose, some of the other projects which we are having to pick up as a result of uh, the state government's lack of spending in Brisbane. Um, Green Camp Road. Now we've we've seen Councillor Cumming has criticised us repeatedly uh, for uh, budget blowouts on Green Camp Road. Well, I would just encourage. Um, anyone that's following closely just to look at the amount of spending for Green Camp Road in this year's uh, budget to see just how low a proportion of uh, the spend that that is. It's a $28 million project, uh, the $141,000 spend in this year's budget papers. Not going into any commercial confidence uh, details there, but he's made a big song and dance about, uh, about that issue, uh, and yet it was handled completely uh, within uh, the contingency there. We also have the uh, uh, Wynnum Road Stage 1B. Now, I've spoken about this in the chamber before, um, and this is the part of the Wynnum Road upgrade which I think delivers the most bang for buck. So this is all the uh, intersection upgrades, the bus indent bays, the uh, corridor improvements beyond the Canning Bridge section where things start to get very difficult in terms of resuming land and widening the corridor there. Um, this has a, an extremely positive uh, benefit cost ratio this project and uh, we see that that really ramps up uh, this year and will be completed so uh, we will deliver uh, both Wynnum Road stage 1a and 1b this year and deliver a major uh, travel time saving and traffic congestion uh, busting project for residents in the eastern suburbs. Um, I also just want to uh, cover off on some of the things that Councillor Griffiths said in the debate. He said that the south side uh, continues to lose out in uh, in these budgets, and I mean we've asked Councillor Griffiths for years to provide any evidence that the south side is actually losing out versus the north side, uh, and and he continues to just repeat the same lines as if saying them again and again will make them true. Of course, we know that the only reason that the south side uh, might lose out is because they elect proportionately more Labor councillors uh, than LNP councillors, and that's just unfortunate for them that they have Labor councillors, but that would be the only reason, because there is no disparity of funding between north and south side of the river at all. Uh, and until Councillor Griffiths can come in here and show us any proof of that, then it is just, it is just a salacious lie that he's hoping that if he repeats it often enough, people will believe it. Now, um, he also said something. Uh, which I want to pick up on. He said that this, this um, administration stands for infrastructure for the inner city, and Councillor Shri um, had that fantastic gotcha moment earlier in the debate uh, today. Uh, well, this administration has delivered Clem 7, the uh, north-south bypass tunnel between um, Kangaroo Point and um, uh, Bowen Hills, and then out to Green Slopes. It's delivered Legacy Way between the Western Freeway um, uh, and then through to uh, Bowen Hills there. Uh, it's delivering Kingsford Smith Drive, uh, which is uh, all through Hamilton and connecting into the city bypass. And then uh, Wynnum Road, which is uh, well, down there at um, East Brisbane. Uh, and of course, the go between bridge at West End. Now, uh, I don't think there are a whole range of inner city suburbs there. I think that they're an equal proportion of inner city suburbs and uh, outer suburban or, or, or inner suburban ring suburbs. Um, but let's remember, the Labor Party only delivered one infrastructure project when they were in office. And do you know the name of that project? The inner city bypass, okay? So when it comes to talking about governments that delivered projects for the inner city, the Labor Party delivered one project during their time in office and that was the inner city bypass. So we'll take no lectures from the Labor Party on inner city versus outer suburbs. Now, um, Councillor Cassidy also uh, bagged us out. He said we'd underfunded a whole range of projects in his ward. And um, you know, he said, I didn't think we'd be seeing funding for traffic calming this year. So he'd obviously written his speech where he said we didn't get funding for traffic calming. And then he said, oh, but you know, he conceded that Councillor Cooper was um, generous and, and did actually provide uh, that money. But he says one thing in here and then he says another thing out in his community on his Facebook page. Because if you go to his Facebook page, you see Councillor Cassidy on there and it's like Christmas in July. 
You know, it is like funding secured in big text. And there's Councillor Cassidy with his big grin and his rosy cheeks and his big red sack. And he's going around saying, we've got funding secured here, funding secured there, funding secured. Everyone gets a car. You get a car. You get a car. You get a car. You get a car. And, and do you think that he thanks the Lord Mayor or this administration for any single one of those projects? Or is it Councillor Cassidy? I'm Councillor Cassidy. I secured this for you. I did this for Councillor you. Councillor Murphy, your time has expired. Oh. Further speakers? <laughs> Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you very much, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on Program 2 with great delight. Um, almost one of the best programs in, in the bu budget, Councillor Cooper. Um, having, having been a Chair of Environment, Parks and Sustainability, I might argue the toss on that and, de and debate in the next program, but it certainly is one of the great programs uh, in the Council budget, uh, providing infrastructure for Brisbane. And it's worth restating the program goal, which is completely lost on the opposition. It's to enable safe, efficient and sustainable movement of people, freight and services. Freight and services. I think these are things that are completely lost on the Labor Party in particular, that this is not just about the, the, the residents of Brisbane, although it is, but it's also about how to make our, our city efficient, how to make our city efficient for the management of business how to make our city grow. It, that relies on business efficiency. That relies on efficient infrastructure. And that's what this budget provides for. As has been said, uh, and in the, Lord, the Lord Mayor said in his speech, we've dedicated to building infrastructure for the Brisbane of tomorrow. Over $800 million invested in delivery of major in intersection upgrades, uh, key cycling links and projects to combat congestion in the suburbs. But it's all about keeping people freight and services moving. And that's why I'm so pleased to be able to, talk, to stand here today to talk in particular about uh, Kingston Smith Drive. And we've heard a lot of restatement of the uh, Labor Party's mantra on uh, Kingston Smith Drive, the class wars. They're, ma they're maintaining the argument that this is a, a bit of infrastructure just in one ward for the benefit of just one ward. And that is plainly ludicrous plainly ludicrous. This is, as Councillor Cooper said, the major connecting artery between the airport, the Trade Coast Central, the rest of Brisbane and, in fact, the rest of Queensland. Uh, this is the road that, that provides for the uh, movement of freight and people through the Hamilton Ward, yes, but not destined for the Hamilton Ward. Um, the significant number of, of big trucks every day in every direction on that road. We don't have a morning peak in the morning and an afternoon peak in the afternoon in Kingston Smith Drive. It's a 12 to 14 hour peak right through the day in both directions, which tells me that traffic is moving to and from the port, to and from the airport, to and from trade coasts, uh, the Trade Coast area. Uh, and look, a container on the back of a ship, on the back of a truck, doesn't know the ward boundaries. <laughs> it's, it's, it's coming from a delivery point. Uh, coming off a ship or from, via the airport, going to its destination for distribution elsewhere. That's the function of the container on the back of a truck, and that's what the road network needs to provide for. And I've said in the past, Kingsford Smith Drive was designed in the 19th century. Um, I've got photographs of Kingsford Smith Drive from the 19th century when the only traffic on it was a couple of guys on horses and a guy riding a horse and cart. Uh, that, and to, to, to claim, like the ALP did, um, although they have changed their tune on that on, on a couple of occasions, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But in the last election, they claimed it was an unnecessary infrastructure upgrade, and they would they would scrap it. They would scrap it. So they proposed under the under the tenure of the the last uh, little mayoral candidate for the Labor Party that they would scrap the Kings of Mist Drive upgrade. So they would have foregone all the benefits that we currently already have for the Kingston Smith Drive upgrade, the pedestrian path and the cycle path, which have been universally applauded by everybody who uses it as a, a fantastic bit of infrastructure, uh, they wouldn't have provided for that. They wouldn't have provided for the road network that's needed to provide that, that significant important artery from the, uh, from the wharves, from the airport, out through, through to distribution points in Dara, Rockley, elsewhere, and from those points out to the suburbs beyond Brisbane as well. So a fantastic bit of infrastructure. Um, I'd be interested to know what the, ne the next Lord Mayoral candidate for the Labor Party says. Under Ray Smith, the Hamilton Ward candidate for them said, get on with it, do it. The same candidate under 
uh, the, the next Lord Mayoral candidate uh, said, uh, no, we won't do it, uh, stop it, and I'm interested to know what the, the next uh, Lord Mayoral candidate, whoever that might be, uh, whoever that might be, we're, we're always interested to find out who they're proposing to have as their Lord Mayoral candidate, um, and uh, to, to say what they say this time round, because they've flip-flopped on this on several occasions. Um, I wanted to go to some of the budget allocations that we have in this program, um, and it goes to this point as well. Um, I'm really pleased to see that there have been significant all allocations of funds for infrastructure improvements in areas where there aren't any residents of my ward. It's in the ward of Hamilton, but the benefit aren't the Hamilton Ward residents. They're the people who come from all over Brisbane to work in Eagle Farm, to work in Pinkenbar, to work at the airport. Uh, I've made the case in the past, and I'm pleased to see it being delivered in this budget, that there are significant roads that require upgrading in roads like Holt Street, in, in, in Pinkenbar, in Eagle Farm, um, in Laverack Avenue, um, streets that uh, residents from all over Brisbane come to, to work in or access uh, their places of employment uh, that are now getting great investment in improvement. And that's fantastic to see. Um, I, I wanted to go to the issue in talking about that, about road resurfacing budgets. Excuse me for a moment. Um, there's been a lot of talk this afternoon about road resurfacing. Um, and the point was made, um, and uh, the Councillor Deegan Ward made the point that the, the program of road resurfacing is put forward by officers from asset services, as has always been the case. It's asset services officers who put forward proposals for road resurfacing, and it's delivered by field services. But the budget sits in program two, and that's why it sits here. Um, the, the history of road res the road resurfacing budget was that Lord Mayor Graham Quirk, um, four years ago, accelerated the expenditure on road resurfacing. He committed to uh, a commitment of uh, $90 million per year for four years to do a, a, an acceleration of road resurfacing. What you've seen in this budget is coming back essentially to an historic um, expenditure, as was the case before that acceleration. So the claims that have been made about budget cuts are, are completely fallacious because uh, we had four years of acceleration and now we're getting a slight deceleration and it means that um, we, we're back to uh, essentially the program of delivery as it was before the accelerator program was required. But there are some fantastic uh, um, uh, expenditures on road resurfacing. Uh, road resurfacing. I'll just go to that in the budget book. Um, over 370 roads being resurfaced, eight pages, eight pages in the budget book uh, of roads being resurfaced. If the Labor Party if the Labor Party chooses not to support Program 2 or to um, sit, stand behind the, the, uh, the, the tables and, and not support it, uh, what they will not be supporting are programs like Aquarius Street in Inala, uh, Barclay Street in Deegan, uh, Beams Road in Zilmere, Beanley Road in Sunnybank. Let's continue. Blunder Road in Durack and Polara, uh, Cansdale Street in Yuronga, Carlton Terrace in Wynnum. And uh, it goes on, I'm just up to the seas. Cutler Avenue in Maruka, uh, Dave, David Street in Tennyson. Um, Mr Chair, in the budget book, um, there are pro uh, projects that are funded all across the city. And there's great evidence for that in this road resurfacing program. Um, and it shows precisely what has been said by other speakers on this side. Uh, the Labor Party narrative, Councillor Griffith's narrative, uh, as per normal, reading the script that he had last year and the year before that and the year before that, the class war narrative that he likes to uh, come up with every year, year in, year out, lazily delivering a, a rinse and repeat of what he said in the past, does not pay any account of what's actually delivered in the budget book in this program. This is a fantastic program for everyone in the city. Uh, and, uh, Mr Chair, I'd just like to conclude by saying a few things about some projects that are specific to my area um, in terms of forward planning. I started on this being a, an infrastructure program that delivers for everybody in the city. And I was very pleased to hear in the budget information session that our traffic planners are looking to future intersection improvements on a major artery road like Sandgate Road. Uh, this is something that I've advocated for. And I know Councillor Cooper has in particular uh, heeded these uh, requests. And we've now got the forward planning to look at a major intersection at uh, Abbotsford Road and Frodsham Street, which 
fits into the forward planning that was done through the Albion Neighbourhood Plan. So a plan that was introduced over a decade ago, looks at the forward needs of the city, looks at the forward in infrastructure requirements of the city, and we're, we're seeing that now being delivered by the expenditures coming through in this program. Mr Chair, I commend this program to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Cooper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to respond to some of the commentary. So I thank all of the councillors who participated uh, in the debate today. Uh, I was disappointed to hear some of the comments. Some of them I thought were, um, well, some of them were a repeat uh, performance from last year. It's, it's like um, perhaps you don't bother to write a new speech. You just take out the speech you used last year and you um, dust it off and you uh, think that that's a good way to actually uh, debate a new budget document, which is a new document altogether. Uh, I note that Councillor Griffiths um, was very contemptuous of the budget. Uh, he again put forward his regular um, debate point, which is he believes it's all about somebody against someone else. So it was north side against south side. Um, then it was outer suburbs against inner suburbs. And then it was ALP against LNP. So it's always somebody against somebody else. And I think that that is a really facile uh, attempt at debating. Uh, let's be honest. I am the council for Brackenridge. Uh, do my residents only and exclusively drive on infrastructure in Brackenridge Ward? Do they reach the edge of Brackenridge Ward and stop on that infrastructure and then go no farther? No, they actually go out to Sandgate to enjoy the beautiful foreshore. They come into town and enjoy, the, enjoy City Hall. They go to every single location in this city that you could possibly imagine. They're up at Mount Cutha, up at the summit, enjoying the view. They're over there checking out Tui Forest. They travel on every road in this city. And this council is responsible for every road in this city. And for us to be as foolish as the Labor Party seemed to suggest, that we were to say, you know what, let's make sure the, the roads in LNP wards are OK and let the, let the roads in the ALP wards be terrible, then our residents would think we were incredibly negligent and we would never do such a foolish thing because they're all roads that every driver, every bus, traverses, every cyclist utilises, every pedestrian um, promenades along. So does, for example, again, a bus, the 330, does the 330, which really services very, very well, Deegan Ward and Brackenridge Ward, does it stop at the edge of Brackenridge Ward? Does it go no farther than Deegan Ward? No, it travels through Marchant. It ends up wandering through um, into Central. It, it travels in every ward on every road uh, along that route. And so, of course, the work that we do, every intersection is used by people from every ward. All 26 wards have people using every piece of infrastructure across the city. So that argument is fundamentally flawed. And I think it is a real, the politics of envy seems to be the mantra, the philosophy that underpins the debate from the Australian Labor Party. And I think that that is poor, poor form. We had Councillor Strunk saying, um, what was the money for Progress Road Stage 4 and Johnson and Stapleton Road? Uh, what is that money in the budget? Those are actually the defects and maintenance periods, so that finalisation of those particular um, processes. He kept on talking about the information session of yesterday, which was actually Friday. So um, just to be clear, we were talking about, and then he, he raised the issue of pork barrelling. So he went through, he pulled out the schedules, and he said it's all about pork barrelling, which I think, again, is a really superficial and rather amateurish approach to the budget debate. And he talked about, he said preliminary road design money was all LNP wards. Well, if he'd look, let's see the first one, Beams Road is Gympie Road to Hanford Road. That is Castledine, Fitzgibbon and Zilmere. And I think Councillor Cassidy would agree with me that that actually is Brackenridge Ward and Deegan Ward. So he was wrong there. And then he said, so he said there was 
and then he said none, didn't he? That's right. So, and then we look Robinson Road, Murphy Road intersection, which is Gbung, Aspley, and Zilmere. And it, in fact, Councillor Cassidy mentioned it in his budget debate that it affects three wards, including Deegan Ward. So that was incorrect. Then we had him talk about um, bridge and culverts, all being LNP wards. I look again. Um, we've got Wynnum Road, Wynnum West. Would that not be in Councillor Cummings' ward? I would think that that would be Councillor Cummings' ward. So he's incorrect on that one. And if I look also, another one in the bridge and culvert construction, and that's Beams Road, which is currently underway. And that's actually in, again, Brackenridge Ward and Deacon Ward. Councillor Cassidy, I believe, also mentioned that in his debate. So he's incorrect in his comments in respect to that. He also said he went through different projects and he you know, is trying to manifest this argument that it's all unfair and all unreasonable. Uh, and then he went on to the um, LATM, so two out of those 12 are in Labor wards, and I would suggest uh, these are prioritised by officers based on what they think are uh, important projects to focus on, uh, but that's a reasonable, I would think, in terms of the distribution of councillors in this chamber, that there is certainly um, this being shared quite reasonably. Then he went on to the um, Lannies. He said, oh, there's 19 out of five there. So he thought that was fair in terms of projects being distributed in an even um, sense. So he lost that argument with himself. But then he said, oh, but the money, if you actually, if you actually count, calculate the money that's being expended through that program, then that's not fair. So, you know, really, what a load of nonsense. What a juvenile way of arguing about how we allocate expenditure. And then um, I, I was absolutely thrilled by Councillor Shree's um, very neat question that was put to uh, Councillor Strunk and was uh, really a beautiful piece of justice served up to him delightfully. So thank you very much, Councillor Shree, for your, I think, very pertinent comments. Then we had Councillor Cumming saying that how clever it was um, with respect to the cruise ship terminal, how clever it was that the state government didn't put any money into delivering any upgrade for the cruise ship terminal, how clever it was for the state government and how foolish council was and how clever it was for the state government to dupe the ratepayers of Brisbane into funding this. Well, that is the only way to interpret your comments because you know who pays. It is the ratepayer of Brisbane. Brisbane, who is being Point of duped. Order. Point of order. Plain to be misrepresented. Noted. Councillor Cooper. I'll just read um, the comments. Well done, state government, in getting council. And he said council was not clever enough to get it for nothing. So nice one, councillor. Thank you very much for that really, really mature comment on your part. He also was trying to again suggest that uh, Kingsford Smith Drive was just a project where we were going to see additional cost um, when he knows perfectly well, since it was debated in this chamber, that it is a D and C fixed priced, fixed price, again, fixed price contract. Uh, so he knows perfectly well that his point is invalid and a nonsense. And then he was going on about how everything has just terrible. There's slashing and burning and slashing and burning. And yes, that's why we're delivering 90 road projects, major road projects, and spending $1.3 billion over four years to invest in upgrading infrastructure across this city. And you know what, councillor, through you, Mr. Chair, we have a record that speaks for itself. We deliver infrastructure. When we say we're going to do something, we do it. We get on, we knuckle down, and we make things happen for the people of Brisbane. And that's why, that is why this is the best program of all of the programs in the budget book, because this is where you see our commitment to the people of Brisbane. We deliver to make sure we have a great city. We are committed to each and every ward, whether it is held by the Australian Labor Party or whether it's held by any other party. We deliver because every single piece of infrastructure that we put in place benefits every single ratepayer for Brisbane. And that's the way it should be. And we're very proud of our record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Councillor Cumming, your misrepresentation. Madam Chair. I didn't use the word duped, and 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 it was the uh, 
the silly, the silly council administration that that uh, was uh, uh, fooled into acting inappropriately, not the uh, not the ratepayers of Brisbane. Right. All right. Now all those. <coughs> so now we will have the program uh, be put. All those in favour of the program say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called Seconded. by Councillor Burke and Councillor Howard. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 25 in favour and one against. Can you say that again for me? Please read it out again so everyone can hear. Mr Chairman, the ayes have it, the voting being 25 in favour and one against. Thank you. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. I'll now ask uh, Councillor Hammond, could you please present pro uh, Program 3, Clean, Green and Sustainable City? Councillor Hammond. Great pleasure, Mr Chairman. I move that the service of Council, the allocations for the budget and the projects for the year 2019-20 and the rolling projects for the Clean, Green and Sustainable City program as set out on page 40 to 70 and the indicative schedules on page 169 to 176 so far as they relate to program 3 be adopted. Seconded. <coughs> Been moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Councillor Richards, that for the services of Council, the allocations for the operations and projects of the years 2019 20, 2020 21, 2021 22, and 2022 23, and the rolling projects for the Clean, Green, and Sustainable City program, as set on pages 40 to 70, and the indicative schedules on pages 169 to 176, so far as they relate to program 3, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'm proud that in 2018-19, Council made great strides towards our city becoming the cleanest, greenest, most sustainable city in Australia. Through the projects and initiatives delivered in Program 3, 18-19, Council delivered sustainability and resilience initiatives for residents and businesses, implemented management and preparedness strategies to reduce flood impacts, improved Council's environmental practices, maintained Council's carbon neutrality, prevented and reduced pollution, protected, enhanced and restored Brisbane's natural, natural assets, planned for, developed and maintained park and natural areas, maintained the health of our waterways, river and bay, sustainably managed Council's water use and resources, managed and reduced the waste and litter, and developed environmental regulatory services. I'd like to highlight several successes in 1819 Clean, Green and Sustainable City program. Effectively managing and enhancing green space across the city was a key achievement in 2018-19 year. Council maintained and enhanced over 2,100 parks and undertook significant improvements at the New Farm Park promenade City Botanical Gardens, Newstead Park, 
Mogul District Sports Park. I am also delighted to say that in 1819, Council secured 110 hectares of significant habitat through the Bushland Preservation Program. We are fortunate to live in the most biologically diverse capital in Australia, supporting thousands of plants and animal species. Our natural assets need to be protected, and the Bushland Acquisition Program enables us to do this. We are well on track of delivering 750 hectares, um, hectares of green space, having purchased over 700 hectares since 2016. This is an accomplishment we all in this chamber should celebrate. In 1819, Council invested in significant environmental initiatives to support our natural environment and residents. The Brisbane Koala Science Institute was opened in mid-2018 in partnership with the University of Queensland and Federation University Australia. Council is working <clears throat> to undertake significant research programs into koala disease and translocation within Brisbane. The Henlon Park concept plan was finalised and released to the community in March 2019. Council also achieved the first major milestone for Oxley Creek Corridor Vision, which was developed and released <coughs> sorry, um, of the Oxley Creek Transformation Master Plan. We can be proud that this plan has since received three awards of excellence in planning and urban design. Yeah. The 1819 Clean, Green and Sustainable City Program saw significant steps towards creating an informed and resilient Brisbane community. In June 2018, Council launched the Flood Resilience Home Program in partnership with CitySmart, which aims to build resilience for residential properties affected by frequent overland flow flooding. This program is the first of its kind in Australia and has already aided over 103 properties. Over the past 12 months, we have strengthened our community partnership and increased community engagement. Council celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Green Heart Fair in June, with a record number of people attending, over 22,000. To learn more on sustainable living and waste reduction, in 2018-19, 46 1,775 free native plants were distributed to Brisbane residents. In May 2018, Council made a public commitment to <clears throat> take steps to decrease the effects of single-use plastics on our environment by phasing out helium balloons, plastic straws and single-use plastic bottles from Council events. In early 2017, Council achieved carbon neutrality in accordance with the requirements of the Australian Government National Carbon Offset Standards. Throughout 1819, Council continued its commitment to maintain low carbon and a clean environment. 2019-20 Annual Plan and Budget for Program 3 will continue and build upon works achieved in 1819 while also introducing the new <coughs> innovative projects that will make Brisbane the cleanest, greenest, most sustainable city in Australia now and for future generations. This is a $734 million plan and budget to deliver clean, green and sustainable outcomes for our residents, city, suburbs and natural environments. It sees $26.7 million for new parks, $22.8 million to green our suburbs, $20 million for the Green Future Fund, and a $386,000 investment in crucial koala research. This budget will also progress several significant natural environment projects across our city. $5.5 million towards the Oxley Creek Transformation Project, $3 million towards the Northern Suburbs Environment Centre, $6.5 million towards the Norman Creek 2012-2031 project, and $900,000 for renewing Great Brisbane Gardens project, which I'm sure Councillor Sheree you'll be very heavily involved with, as this year's focus is at Kangaroo Point Cliffs. 
I'd like to highlight one of the most exciting projects included in the new plan and budget, the Victoria Park vision. This project will see the Victoria Park golf course transformed <clears throat> into 45 hectare park, the biggest created in almost 50 years. Included in this budget is a million dollar funding commitment for the community consultation on the Victoria Park vision. I'm greatly looking forward to engaging the Brisbane community in this project and more importantly, hear their views and their visions for this beautiful green space. Another landmark project that the 2019-20 plan and budget supports is the Oxley Creek Transformation Project, which will rehabilitate and enhance Oxley Creek Corridor from the Brisbane River to Larapinta, transforming it into a green lifestyle and leisure destination. The first major milestone step towards achieving the vision for the corridor was through the development of the master plan, which was released in October 2018. This budget commits $5.5 million to fund the Oxley Creek transformation, which will, <coughs> which will progress and deliver of the project initiatives identified in the master plan. Notably, this includes the staged delivery of the nature-based adventure parkland and the precinct planning for the Archer Field wetlands. Tr Team Shrina will continue to increase bushland coverage across the city in 2019-20 through the Bushland Acquisition Program. This program was launched by the former Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor Sally Ann Atkinson in 1990, with a purchase <clears throat> in her first year in September of 12.22 hectares of land in the Mount Cutha Reserve. Council has committed to purchasing 750 hectares of land, between, um, of land between 2016 and 20, and as part of this accelerated land acquisition through the Bushland Acquisition Program, as I have mentioned before, I am proud to say we are very close to um, obtaining this um, target. And you may have, <clears throat> and as I've already said, we have already secured 700 hectares of bushland in the 2019-20 budget. We are committed $15.5 million to the acquisition of bushland to support rare and endangered ecosystem plants, animals, and connect ecological corridors across our city. In 2019-20, this administration is committed committing $22 million towards the Green Future Fund project, which will create more parks, sporting fields and green space for Brisbane. This funding will be allocated to acquiring land for future parklands, as well as community consultation and concept designs for park improvements. We look forward to engaging with the community in 1920 to establish sites across Brisbane that will make for great new parkland, which will support our native flora and fauna, while also creating more to see and do for our Brisbane community. This budget will see a focus on greening Brisbane suburbs through extensive tree planting within our suburbs and along major road, city roads. Tree planting within our suburbs will support cooling the amenity outcome <coughs> and amenity outcomes within our suburbs and beautify busy local corridors. This administ administration will invest $22.8 million towards planting and maintaining trees across the suburbs, as well as $2 million to plant trees in Zilmia, Paddington, Green Slopes and Maori to improve the amenity of local shopping areas and beautify busy traffic corridors. $107,000 will also be dedicated to planting jacaranda trees in New Farm, Olimba and St Lucia. In our efforts to make Brisbane the koala capital of Australia in 1920, budget dedicates 387,000 towards the delivery of a koala research work, which focuses on key issues facing koalas in Brisbane. This is, there is still a lot we don't understand about diseases in koalas, and if we can improve our understanding, we have a better chance of controlling these threats and conserving koalas in the Brisbane region. Council is working with the University of Queensland and Federation Uni Australia to undertake significant research projects that will pro provide tangible benefits to koalas in Brisbane and southeast Queensland. We also look forward to 
<coughs> expanding the Flood Resilience Home Program in the new budget. This program is all about creating an informed and safe Brisbane community by building resilience for residents' properties affected by frequent overland flow flooding. $2.9 million has been allocated in the 2019-20 and continue the pilot program with 716000 allocated to complete the roll-out roll in Paddington and Inala precincts, as well as been expanded to include Wavell Heights and Camp Hill. Based on 1819 uptakes, it's predicted that 390 properties will uptake a flood-wise home service, and over the coming financial year, we expect or predicted 250 properties will participate in the flood-wise resilience initiative scheme. This is an initiative that will affect, <coughs> um, which, which is effective, um, and something that we can all be very proud of. I'm looking forward to hearing Councillor Howard's um, presentation shortly on 3.5, and I do know that Councillor Howard and I are working together and very proud to deliver on this beautiful pro on this project, clean, green, and sustainable city. Together, Councillor Howard and I will work to make um, Brisbane even cleaner and greener and more sustainable to into the future. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Chair, it is an honour to deliver my first budget speech as Chair of Field Services, but before I begin, I wish to congratulate the Lord Mayor on his first budget, which keeps Brisbane on the right track, and to thank both Councillor Mattock and Councillor McLaughlin for their stewardship at the helm of Program 3 in previous years. Councillors Mattock and McLaughlin are committed to protecting Brisbane's rich biodiversity, green space and minimisation of waste. They both know I am passionate and vocal about this space and will continue to encourage growth, innovation and efficiency. With more than 5,000 kilometres of footpaths in Brisbane, the task of maintaining and repairing will never stop, and neither will I. And as Councillor Adams advised the Chamber earlier today, when the LNP was elected, this administration set out to increase the condition of footpaths across Brisbane. We have lifted the good condition of footpaths from 42 per cent to 77 per cent, and that's quite remarkable. But also we've seen the fair condition of footpaths reduced from 48 per cent to 16.5 per cent. I can assure the Chamber that Council investigates each and every footpath reported by our residents. Safety and accessibility is our priority, as it should be. This priority takes into account the location, pedestrian use and extent of damage. We also look at nearby facilities. For example, if near a school, hospital, retirement home, then the work is scheduled to be completed even sooner. It is important to note that make safe works are always undertaken to ensure that a footpath is safe and functional before more permanent repairs are actioned. Everyone here knows that this administration has a strong and proud track record of delivering initiatives to support a clean, green and sustainable city. We do this not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it is what our residents expect. I'd now like to move to a topic that many may take for granted, and that's waste management. We are a leader in waste and litter management. Those in the chamber and residents listening may not know that our waste and resource recovery infrastructure, collection services, waste disposal and litter management services are award winning. And our awards include uh, the Keep Australia Beautiful Dame Phyllis Frost Award for litter prevention, we were the winner of the Keep Queensland Beautiful Sustainable Cities Award, the Australasian Waste and Recycling Expo Innovation Award for the Brisbane Bin and Recycling App. And then just today, we have the Mobile Muster, where we've been named Top Recycler Award in Queensland. Here, here, here brought back by, uh, by my wonderful Deputy Councillor Marks from the Australian Local Government Association. It's not the first time that we've won that award and it will not be the last, I can assure you. So through real action, we have delivered a variety of programs and initiatives. We are actively engaging with the Brisbane community to further educate and promote waste reduction and avoidance strategies. 
The Waste and Resource Recovery Services Branch within Field Services continues to deliver excellence in customer service to Brisbane residents and sets the benchmark in waste and litter management across Australia. The management and reduction of waste in a growing city like Brisbane is a key focus of our citywide objective of clean, green and sustainable. This budget plans for a record investment of more than $190 million in operating funds for waste and recycling management and city cleaning. To demonstrate the enormity of waste and recycling in Brisbane, we collect bins more than 30 million times each year. This investment is worth every cent. We see growth and improvement in our services every year. The costs associated with the collection and disposal of the contents of the red, yellow and green top bins equates to more than $60 million annually. Through council initiatives, we will strive towards further reducing waste to landfill and increasing resource recovery because household garbage is not only a big cost environmentally, but also financially. Most will know of the Green Waste Recycling Service. Currently, more than 96,000 householders participate in the program and more than 25,000 tonnes of green waste is collected and diverted from landfill. To encourage further participation in this service, I welcome the commitment under Program 3.5 to remove the $30 establishment fee from 1 July. From the weekly mow to the storm season garden cleanup, green waste recycling bins are an easy and affordable way to recycle your garden waste. The annual curbside large item collection will again take place this year with an investment of $6.4 million. And instead of throwing things out, I encourage households to consider recycling or reusing items through donations to charities or one of the council's tip shops. Council is continually looking at alternate and sometimes novel ways to maximise the recoverable co component of this 12,000 tonne curbside collection. We will be exploring the following initiatives in the following financial year. The extraction of clean timber to convert into fuel. The extraction of mattresses to recover metals. We've already recovered 120 tonnes of metals so far. The extraction of HDPE plastics and the extraction of e-waste. Tip shops are part of Program 3.5, and we are committing more than $1.1 million to this initiative in 2019-20. One person's trash can be another person's treasure. There are two tip shops, one at Jibung and one at Acacia Ridge, both of which were frequented by more than 65,000 visitors in the last year. This diverted approximately 570 tonnes of reusable goods that were destined for landfill. Recycling at work is just as important as recycling at home to help reduce the amount we send to landfill and recover valuable resources. With $293,000 allocated to the business recycling service in this budget, we anticipate participation in almost 1,400 businesses. Now, I can't take credit for the Love Food Hate Waste program as it was Councillor Maddox's idea and under whose leadership it grew into the success it is. But I am pleased to announce that in the 2019-20 budget, Council has committed $323,000 to continue this internationally recognised food waste minimisation program. Mm -hmm. Throughout 2019-20, this campaign will provide opportunities for residents to get involved with reducing food waste through cooking classes, community engagement activities and education. With almost 82,000 tonnes of food and kitchen waste sent to landfill in 2018-19, Love Food Hate Waste is vitally important in every household. Our zero waste commitment has been embraced by Brisbane residents and it is through their support that waste avoidance and recycling initiatives are a realistic goal. Before I swap my hard hat to field services, I see it as everybody's responsibility to do their bit in keeping Brisbane a clean and green city. I'll now speak briefly about our community initiative, which encourages everyone to pick up two pieces of litter per week, every week of the year, aptly named 104 or more. This initiative, in combination with Council's litter bins and street cleaning, will make a big difference to keep Brisbane and our city clean and litter-free. Brisbane is regarded as one of Australia's cleanest cities, and only this administration will keep it that way. Yeah, yeah. Field services provide the high quality and value for money civil construction, maintenance and services to Brisbane ratepayers. The portfolio works in four distinct areas, asphalt and aggregates, construction, urban amenity and asset services. 
every year the field services team delivers for Brisbane, from pothole maintenance to weed management and graffiti removal. It is true that this portfolio really is at the front line of council delivery. In the 2019-20 period, the delivery of operational services will include the fourth year of the $360 million Smoother Suburban Streets program, which has been discussed in the chamber earlier today. And I'll draw everyone's attention to page 35 of the book, where we see that the $72,200 mentioned there is in fact the balance of the $360 million Smoother Suburban Streets. And we see that going forward, we are back to our 90, 000 a year, 90 million, sorry, 90 million a year. I always do that. Um, this is just some of the work the diligent team in field services do for the people of Brisbane each and every day. The delivery of services through my branch is seen daily by residents and it's delivering in spades what they do best. I take this opportunity in my closing remarks to offer my sincere gratitude to the hard-working and dedicated officers in field services and waste recovery resource services. The mantra, a clean, green and sustainable city, is more than just words for this administration. It is the way we operate. It's about ensuring we deliver on our commitment to each ratepayer who sees Brisbane as a city in which to work, study, live and raise our family. Team Schrinner has a vision for the future of our city. Together with Councillor Hammond, I'm committed to delivering a strong plan now with a vision for the future. Our 2019-20 budget is dedicated to ensuring the Brisbane of tomorrow is even better than the Brisbane of today. And Chair, I commend this budget to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on uh, Program 3, Clean, Green and Sustainable City. Can I uh, say from the outset we have significant uh, concerns with this, uh, with this program and the delivery of this program. Um, we believe that this is a sham budget in terms of what has been put forward. It's obviously a budget to deal with an election, but it's not really a budget about the people of Brisbane. Our major concern um, with this budget relates to the bushland buyback funding. And uh, going through this funding and what is listed in this budget, our concern is the way the money is being allocated and spent. Um, going through the figures, since this administration has been in power, there's been over $73 million raised in the Bushland Acquisition Fund and, ex and expended in that fund. Interestingly for us, of those sites brought back, 70 million, over $70 million of that money has been spent or pork barrelled into LMP wards. $70 million, and I see Councillor Burke laughing about this, $70 million of $73 million raised from residents' bushland fund in the last four years has been spent in LMP wards. Three million has been spent in ALP wards. We have uh, con significant concerns. This is, um, this is a graph, uh, or this is um, showing the funding and where it's spent highlighted. Uh, and you'll quite clearly see that the orange there indicates all the LMP wards uh, that receive funding. Um, and the purple, there's two purple marks there. They're the other uh, non-LMP wards that receive funding. Just two, just two. We, uh, we believe that this funding has been inappropriately used. We're really concerned about this. We believe it's a misuse of ratepayer money. It has really been about pork barrelling, and it's not what residents would expect to occur with this bushland money. Yes, you're in government, but no, you're not meant to spend it all in your ward. Um, this concern is really, you know, is serious. Um, and we note that even a couple, well, I note even a couple of weeks ago, there was no money able to be allocated by this administration to actually purchase koala land in Nathan. Um, like, there was no way of finding that money. They believe the, the, the land should be given to them. However, we could find $5.2 million to buy cleared koala land at Mount Cravat. Cleared koala land that had no koalas on it. Interestingly, that $5.2 million is not showing up in this tally of $70 million uh, spent in LMP electorates. 
This is appalling. This is disgusting. And this shows how out of control this administration is with the misuse of public money. I'll be writing to the Auditor General to ask him to review how Council is spending this ratepayer money and the sheer bias nature of the expenditure of this money. Other concerns that we had with, with this budget. The voluntary flood home buyback scheme. We heard that it was there, but there's no money allocated for it. This money has totally disappeared. There was certainly no mention of any properties bought back in the last financial year, and we believe that no properties were bought back under this program last financial year. Similarly, flood resilience. It's interesting where flood resilience is being rolled out and representing one of the areas of the city that floods the most, and most frequently there is no money for flood resilience uh, in Rockley or Archfield. So it's disappointing that once again this money isn't being allocated where the need is across the city. We also heard the chairpersons talk about 387,000 for koala work and research. And we support that. What we're concerned about is that council is not buying land back that actually has koalas on it that actually need to be saved. So it's fine to research them. It's fine for the Lord Mayor to get photographed with them and send it everywhere. But how about being fair income and actually purchasing the land where koalas are? Silence, yes, silence. We are concerned in terms of the koala research as well. What's the overall picture the city is developing about koala tagging? We heard that there was a, a koala tagged at Mansfield. What about the 20 or 25 koalas in Tui Forest? Are they being tagged? What are we doing in terms of a strategy of looking at how we preserve those koalas? What's the strategy we're doing for looking at koalas that aren't in LMP areas? Amazing, isn't it? What is being done with koalas that aren't in LMP areas? Oh, <laughs> they don't exist. No, no, no. So, so Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Murphy. Um, will Councillor Griffiths take a question? Oh, Councillor Griffiths, will you take a question? No. Oh, okay. No, Councillor Murphy, you won't. Councillor Griffiths, please continue. We also have concerns. I know Councillor Johnston and myself have both written uh, to the previous Lord Mayor in regards to purchase of koala land at Oxley. Yeah. Nothing's happened. Um, but there's been a significant spend in LMP areas of $70 million in the last four years. Amazing. And then we talk about the $22 million Green Future Fund, which alias comes from the CBIC, which we believe is dubious in terms of the way that's operating, but, and so does the report into it. Um, but of particular concern is that the chairperson couldn't actually answer how that money was going to be spent. So watch out, everyone. That means this $22 million is up there for an election, and it's going to be pork barreled out all over the place. But unfortunately, it probably won't be pork barreled in the right places across the sea, the places that actually need it. Once again, we have significant concerns about this fund and the way this administration misused their power and misused their massive majority in terms of public funding. And they will do anything to avoid talking about development. So now we talk about koalas and we talk about green things. And the Lord Mayor wears a green tie and a green shirt, and that makes him green. <laughs> it's fascinating. And boots, green boots, yes. It was even more interesting to hear Councillor Howard say what a great job they're doing with footpaths. Councillor Howard, you should go out to Colwell Street at Oxley that's right beside Oxley State School and look at the smashed footpath there because what you've just said is the opposite of what is happening out there. And if you don't believe me, just look up my Twitter feed. You'll find it on there. It was posted on the weekend. It's disappointing that, it's disappointing that this administration is so out of touch. No, I believe Councillor Howard. I believe Councillor Howard believes she's saying the right thing. But this administration is so out of touch with what is actually happening out there in the suburbs. And the suburbs are beyond <laughs> New Farm. 
the suburbs, those places beyond New Farm, and they're places like Oxley and Willowong and Pilara, they're the places that are the suburbs. They're the places that people pay rates in. It's disappointing that you're being given such bad advice about the state of footpaths around the place. Similarly, in this chamber, we had, um, we had the LNP over the last term pass laws that declared jacarandas weed trees. And now they have a major program for planting jacarandas. It's quite incredible. Jacarandas they defined as weed species. And now they're planting them everywhere and saying how wonderful they are because the Lord Mayor loves the colour purple. Tinkerbell loves the colour purple. It's, a, it's incredible. But that's good. That's good. People are happy. And, and surely another issue that we're missing in this program is the pathetic delivery of safety lighting on our pathways. It is appalling. If I see another tree lit up in the inner city with a trillion little fairy lights on it, while we can't get basic lighting on a path through a suburb that connects community facilities with homes with public transport, it just seems absurd. It's the most absurd thing ever to explain to residents, yes, they like lighting that fig tree up. Yes, and they want that tree lit up too. But sorry, we can't provide you with any funding to be safe when you walk home at night. Yeah, safe. To, yeah, well, you got some in Musgrave Park. Yes, yes, you did get some in Musgrave Park. We, we, yes, we've noticed that. Um, we did notice that, Jonathan. Um, but what in, in, in a serious, uh, in an issue that is serious for many residents, they believe that walking on a pathway at night time should be able to be done safely and it should be able to done, be done on a lit pathway. And once again, I think Count, that's Councillor one Griffiths, of one of one expired. council. Councillor Marks. Thank you, Chair. And I rise to pre speak on program three, clean, green and sustainable. And I thank both Councillor Hammond and um, my own chair, Councillor um, Vicky Howard, for all their work that they've done in both these programs. Program three covers quite a number of different areas. Um, one of them is about the delivering the sport parks for Brisbane project that will plan and develop new sport parks to provide district level sporting facilities that will contribute to building an active and healthy city. So for the ward of Runcorn, the residents of Runcorn, the Wally Tate Park in Currabee will be receiving more than a million dollars which will help finalise a detailed design of, um, and commence construction of a district sports park infrastructure, which will include a new junior cricket field, an upgraded senior cricket field, some lighting, some new car parking, internal road upgrade and entryway improvements. This was a project that was identified through the LGIP. At the moment, there is a, uh, a Currabee Knights cricket play down there. They have a seniors um, cricket field. It could do with um, a fair bit of work, so they're looking forward to getting that upgraded. There's also a, a what we call as the, an official dollar, a dog off leash area, which there's a quite a large community use. Um, there's an unofficial dollar down there as well, which is where a fair amount of the community um, do let their dogs run free, d despite it not actually being a, a, uh, an official dollar. Um, but that is also an area where we have the Queensland Lure Coursing. They meet and have a meeting there once a month where their dogs um, do their lure coursing in that. Um, so there was a fair bit of concern with local residents that were uh, initially um, uh, contacted and, and asked for their feedback about the dollar being decreased in size. Um, we asked officers to go back to the drawing board and look at where they could potentially um, change the car park to. And I know that a couple of residents contacted Councillor Shree with the same concern about the dollar and also the potential for some trees being having to be removed to make way for this car park. So I'm quite pleased to announce that um, after consultation with the council officers and the Lord Mayor that that design has been re redesigned. Um, the car park will now be put into a separate, uh, a, a, a different area so that the dollar um, itself won't necessarily be changed in size um, and that the birds that actually nest in that dollar, they're, they're, they're kind of a unique bird that they actually nest in the ground 
and then they fly up out of the ground, um, which is quite interesting having that, and we have it in a dola area. But anyway, the dogs seem to leave the birds alone, and um, so everyone leaves happily along, so that's pretty good. So yeah, so the car park's been moved to a new area. There's the internal road upgrade, which is desperately needed. Um, it's a bit of a accepted issue with this park. While the park area is, is, is huge, the problem we have is that there's actually some state land right in the middle of it, which is the spoil left over from when they did the train line upgrades and that um, the, um, there's also a couple of car parks there that are owned by council, which we lent to Queensland Rail to use um, for residents. Um, who are catching the train. We've now since taken that car park back so we can upgrade it and fix it and, and make it a more usable, friendly area. Um, I do note that the state government did um, offer to um, give us that um, hill of spoil um, in exchange for the car park that we had, which I didn't think it was a particularly great bargain giving them that we were giving them a car park and they were giving us a, a big hill of um, I'll use the polite word, rubbish. Um, it's contaminated land. Um, I'm quite happy to take the land off them, but obviously we would have to spend some millions of dollars rehabilitating that land. So um, hopefully that they may be able to come to the party. Because once that hill of dirt is actually removed, then there would be much easier septed issues through there for everybody um, concerned. Um, we'll also be able to make that roadway entry um, a lot easier to use. And we're also working on some entry improvements as well in conjunction with Currabee Mosque, which is right there at the entrance of the park. Um, and that will help the residents as well, because it's a very well used park. We're in the middle of um, building the um, outdoor gym that's just about nearing completion, and then there'll be a multi use games court also going into that space. So once that's all finished, it's going to be a, um, a, a great area for all the residents to use. Another part of the program is the park's maintenance and renewal, in particular the, the lakes and um, that we have in our parks. Um, I have um, Les Atkinson Park, which is not actually a lake, but it's what you'd call a water body. Um, so this work there that they do there focuses on mechanical harvesting of the aquatic weeds. Um, they do the releasing of the biological controls. They include algae reducing agents and of, of course the water quality monitoring. The problem I have with this particular body of water, of course, is that there, there's a lot of ducks that like to fly and land and swim and live in the Liz Atkinson Park water area. Unfortunately, despite many attempts at educating the public about not feeding the ducks bread, they continue to do so. Um, leftover bread or bread given to ducks that are potentially not fresh, which is why I'm guessing they're throwing it away to the animals, um, can actually be very dangerous for the ducks and can actually be poisonous for them. Um, and any leftover bread that's just left lying around in the park becomes mouldy and that's also very dangerous to them. And of course the other problem with the leftover bread is it does trigger the algae blooms to grow within the water body. Um, so um, if I could put it on the official record that a residents are wanting to feed ducks, they need to use something friendly like corn or seeds or even duck pellets if they feel that way inclined. Um, and we also have a fairly large bat colony there at that Les Atkinson Park, which also obviously has some effect on that water as well. Um, park upgrades continue as always across every single um, suburb in the city. We all have access to our own fund that we know that the Lord Mayor gives us kindly every year. It's the same amount. It doesn't matter whether you're LNP, ALP, a Greens party or an independent candidate. We all get exactly the same dollar amount. Um, it's always nice if you get an upgrade as well that you don't have to pay out of that um, um, fund. So I'm delighted that I've got Franklin Crescent and Currabee. Um, it's a very old playground that obviously the original developer put in many, many years ago on a hill, um, which is not uh, obviously um, DDA compliant. So we've um, started the process by paying out a, an engineer to give us a costing to do some design work on how we can actually do something about that park, park upgrade. Um, and the other thing that's another big area in my ward is um, we call it the Comley Street Drain and Sunnybank. That's a, it's a drain that runs through and ends up in Belimba Creek and um, it's, it's half private land and half council land. And, um, I've always had a problem with this drain. It, it's quite smelly. It click, a lot of the rubbish collects there and everything like that. Um, for some unknown reason, the private 
owners have put um, some barbed wire along the bottom of a fence that runs across the strain, um, which is not only unsightly and dangerous, but actually collects all the rubbish as well. So the officers had um, suggested a thing called a squid. Um, and so that I'm delighted that um, the Lord Mayor has put money in the budget that we can actually put this squid in place into Sunnybank. And that will take care of a lot of the amenity and also the odour from the strain as well. Um, Currabi bushland, um, while I lost the Karawatha forest in my last redistribution, I still do have some of it left in this Currabi bushland. So I'm delighted that there's more than $100,000 in the budget to um, regrade the SHIP circuit. Can I just spell that out for the clerks? S-H-I-P-P -P circuit, not up SHIP Creek, um, at Currabi bushlands, and that will repair the eroded drainage cross banks and also regrade the track surface. So I'm very um, happy about that. And there's also work at various points along Belimba Creek at El Tandy in Runcorn and Naldi Street, Sunnybank. So as far as I didn't program three goes for the residents of Runcorn, I have to say I'm delighted for what the Lord Mayor has handed down to them in this budget. And I know that once they get my newsletter, they'll be just as happy as I am. Thank you very much. For the speakers, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on program three, clean, green, and sustainable uh, city. Um, I'd like to start by setting the scene a little bit for people. Um, total expenditure and capital in this program is, is $641 million. It's a lot of money um, that's available for um, hundreds and hundreds of projects around uh, the city. Um, when you break it down, uh, you can have a look at how many are in Tennyson Ward, and there are six projects in Tennyson Ward. It's not really six because two are rollovers from last year, uh, and I'll come to those in a moment. So what are the four projects out of $641 million in this city's parks and environmental budget that are being funded in Tennyson Ward? One, Turley Street Park replace, uh, playground replacement, $108,000. Now, two years ago, Council removed this playground, uh, along with four others in my ward, and has not replaced any of them. This will be the first one that there has been any budget funding for to replace a, a park that was removed. So it's not new. It's replacing something they took out uh, and uh, is, is, you know, 100 grand will get a pretty basic little park. So yes, you get a tick for finally doing it, but don't expect a pat on the back for doing something that should have been properly planned and costed um, when you removed the playground two years ago. Second, a genuinely good project we have been asking for, and that is lighting in Normrose Park at uh, uh, Fairfield. Now let's put aside the fact that Normrose Park was named without any community consultation after a Liberal Party member asked uh, the former Lord Mayor. Um, uh, and just talk about what happened in Normrose Park also about two and a half years ago. A young woman was seriously assaulted on her walk between Fairfield Station and her home in Fairfield. Uh, and she was extremely distressed uh, about it and came to see me and we discussed it. And um, it's not good enough uh, that most of the parks in my ward are just not lit. Just there's dozens of them waiting to have yep. lighting through major pathways. Yep. Um, I'm pleased to be able to tell her that there is lighting in Normrose Park. It's also been an issue raised with me by the people who live at Link Vision in Fairfield. Uh, these are people with low vision uh, or blindness, and lighting greatly assists them to distinguish um, uneven terrain through this park and to make their way safely to Fairfield Gardens. So the $95,000 uh, out of the $641 million uh, for tennis and waters is greatly appreciated and this is a good project. Uh, the the uh, two other of the four new projects this year are $18,000 for a bush care group in Corinda and uh, at Hall Avenue and $32,000 for a bush care group at Pratton Street at Corinda. Um, that's it. That's it. Even that is a cut on the amounts that they got last year. So these are our hard-working bush care volunteers. Yeah, these are the people who do council's job for them yes. in my area. They weed, they plant trees, they keep the drains clean. Yeah. What's this council gone and done? Cut the funding oh, yeah. to these groups. Yeah. Not only that, they've also cut one group completely. 
So last year, Cliveden Avenue Bush Care Group also got funding. They're not getting any this year, zero funding for the Cliveden Avenue Bush Care Group. So let me go back and recap. Um, of the four new projects out of a $641 million citywide budget, um, Tennyson Ward is getting a replacement playground, $100,000. $95,000 for lighting in Normorose Park at Fairfield and um, $50,000 for two bush care groups, not three, as is usually the case. That's $250,000 out of a budget of $641 million. Now, I don't think that even the most objective person looking at the allocation of budget funds in Tennyson Ward could say that that's reasonable. That is reasonable um, because uh, this is actually a good year, just quietly. <laughs> I have not had a parks project funded um, in the uh, parks budget uh, for playgrounds since 2010. That's nine years ago. So this is the first one. Um, and I'm not counting Ken Fletcher, because that was a whole other dodgy deal. Um, but the uh, last time was a small playground uh, at Earlston Place uh, near the back of Corinda Library, and that was in 2010. And I think from memory that was $80,000. So that's nine years without a playground upgrade. Now, I don't know any person that would think that that is reasonable at all. So $641 million. Now, the two projects that are rolling over, so this is money promised last year that was unable to be delivered by this administration, uh, the Heritage Tree Project at Chelma. Now, that was $119,000 last year. It's now $479,000. And there are very complex roadworks involved with what is proposed, which I think will be somewhat controversial. So, Lord Mayor, get ready for those letters. Uh, two um, is the drainage project for the culvert that is collapsing collapsing, it's the main stormwater drain under Brisbane Corso out to the river, $463,000 budgeted last year. The council was unable to complete the project that's being done possibly this year. That's it. That's it. Um, but let me now, I just think that's disgraceful. Um, now, I know that the opposition want to stand up and say, oh, it's a politics of envy and they'll make all those arguments. But when you don't invest in this uh, budget, uh, you don't invest in this community, um, you are hurting yourselves. Um, and this kind of slap in the face, um, when there is $641 million available to fund projects in the ward, um, is not good enough. Now, um, the other issues that I want to briefly discuss, uh, and a flag I have an amendment as well, um, is the uh, Green Slush Fund, the Greener Brisbane Futures or whatever that's called. Uh, now, um, uh, along with the bushland buyback levy, from my understanding there's some $35 million available uh, this year uh, for buyback of bushland, green space and recreational space. Now, I wrote to the Lord Mayor uh, a few weeks ago outlining the priorities in uh, Tennyson Ward, and uh, these include um, uh, making sure the state hands over land that has been promised at the Oxley Secondary College site. That includes bushland and sporting fields. Uh, two, uh, the looking at whether we can acquire the Yoronga Bowls Club uh, as a community hub to allow um, community groups and bowls to continue. Uh, three, helping South Juniors complete their oval at Ron Porter Field at Fairfield. Council is making this tiny little junior cricket club do the DA, do the full remediation, do the restructuring, and they're making them do it. Meanwhile, I think it was $10 million spent out at wherever it was, Bell Bowery or Kenmore or somewhere last year. But it's OK because South Juniors are hard at it at Fairfield with their own money um, uh, to get this done. Uh, I've also called for some land at 143 Hyde Road, Yoronga, which is partially zoned industrial and partially zoned sport and rec to be bought back. Um, this would create new parkland in Yoronga in flood prone area. I've also called for the old Nielsen home at Chelmer on Rosebury Terrace to be brought back to form part of a new riverside park uh, just near the Walter Taylor Bridge. And I've also called on council to let, not even do anything, I just want council to let West Juniors um, use 
Gordon Thompson Oval again for junior sport. I mean, I don't want them to invest money, I just want them to let them use it. Six years ago, council stopped and said the oval needed to be remediated, but there's no chance they're actually going to do that. So these, and, and to my request to the Lord Mayor, he said, have a look in the budget. Well, I've looked in the budget, Lord Mayor. $641 million, four, pro, four new projects funded, totaling about $250,000. If that's the way that you are going to treat genuine requests, then I'm very happy to tell residents because they're asking me and all I have to do is show them what you are doing. Um, now, of course, drainage is being ignored again in Tennyson Ward this year and that is not good enough from my point of view. So I move the following amendment to program, two, uh, program three, sorry, I've got the wrong one. Program three, clean, green and sustainable city. I move that. 1.614 million is transferred from item 3.3.5.1, manage Mount Kutha Botanic Gardens and reserve summit car park improvements to item 3.4.3.3, drainage construction and resilience, drainage construction and resilience, that's the actual name of the item and the project, to install new backflow valves as identified in the AECOM backflow investigation report in Chelmer, Graceville, Tennyson, Yoronga and Fairfield. Seconded. An amendment, an amendment has been moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by uh, Councillor Griffiths. To the amendment, please. Uh, and please, um, can we arrange for the distribution of the, the motion and please speak to the motion? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman, and I am passing it to the clerk now. Uh, now, uh, there is $1.614 million uh, in the budget this year for car park was, uh, works at the Summit Car Park at Mount Cutha. And whilst I feel a little bit of guilt about taking that money away from a car park uh, upgrade, it's not as urgent and it's not as significant priority as making sure that the recommendations from Council's independent uh, flood report after the 2011 floods are implemented. That is obviously uh, critical work that needs to be undertaken. Um, in my ward, uh, there are numerous valve locations that have been identified but have not been funded uh, by this Lord Mayor, and they've been deprioritised. We've been told, um, repeatedly I've been told, that they no longer, that they no longer uh, protect uh, enough people, therefore they're not considered to be a priority. These are in places like uh, Victoria Avenue in Chelmer, uh, the O Streets in Yoronga, around Girraween Park in Graceville, uh, in Stephen Street, Yoronga, uh, in um, many other places uh, where residents were flooded, um, not because the river flooded them, but because water charged back up uh, the backflow, uh, the drainage valves uh, in uh, my area. And uh, that is problematic. So this council recommended, uh, report recommended 51 locations be funded around the city, and to my knowledge, um, 15 have been done. Now, some of these have been in my ward, and they are welcome, um, but there are still 15 in my ward um, locations that have been identified that have not been funded. Eight years on from the flood, when we're not flooding, we cannot take our eye off the ball, and we must continue to fund um, the important flood recommendations to ensure that they are all done before the next big flood hits Brisbane. This is a simple amendment. Um, essentially, it will say uh, $1.614 million um, from a nice-to-have project is transferred to a must-have project, which will deliver security uh, and uh, safety to those residents who are flooded at times of flooding from the inadequacy of Council's stormwater drainage system. In my area, people were trapped in their homes and unable to evacuate the day before it flooded um, because water cut the road when uh, it charged back up the stormwater, uh, the stormwater drains. So in my view, it's critical. I'd certainly like to see them done all over the city. Uh, I'd certainly like to see them done in every single one of the 35 locations, to my knowledge, that still require to be done. Um, 
Council did undertake this um, investigation and asked uh, engineers AECOM to do this review, and they've produced a really useful report. Um, it sits directly behind my desk, and I look at it almost every week because it is so essential that we do not lose sight of the fact that we need to improve uh, drainage and flood mitigation for low-lying suburbs in our city. Um, now, the car park at Mount Cutha can wait another year while the backflow valves are done uh, in uh, Chelma, Graceville, Tennyson, Ironga and Fairfield to achieve flood immunity uh, for Brisbane residents. Um, this is also really important because um, Councillor McLaughlin, has had, when he was uh, the chair, had taken writing to me saying um, that uh, people who live in these areas um, are eligible for Council's Flood Resilient Homes Program. Yes. Yes. Now, he wrote to me twice about this, yes. even though um, it was only available in Paddington and Inala. He was writing to me telling uh, me that residents in my ward could access this $50,000 to make their homes flood resilient. Uh, no, mate, I've got it in writing. It's on my desk. I should have got it. I'll have to keep going. Hopefully, I can do it in the summer. So, um, uh, I've got it in writing and it's sitting on my desk. So the big issue is that this administration has told people that they can access a program that they're not eligible, uh, they're not eligible to access because of the suburb that they live in. Now I don't think that is acceptable, and that's why I'm moving uh, that we transfer this money from the Mount Cutha car park upgrade to deliver on essential essential um, drainage and backflow uh, valve devices that are needed in low-lying flood-prone parts of our city. Lord Mayor. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that this meeting be adjourned until 9am tomorrow morning. Seconded. Uh, thank you. It's uh, been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that this meeting of Council adjourn until 9am tomorrow morning, the 20th of June. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. See you tomorrow.